Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the conference of the Czech Education Village conference that we prepared with the National Pedagogic Institute and, the, and with Meeting Brno. I am Marketa Bekova and together with David Macek we are going to guide you through today's program. Welcome on my own behalf. I'm really glad to meet you in such a great number at the end of the school year. Educational village, it's a phrase uh, uh, used for the name of this conference, is a concept that we are trying to work with. This is the second event. We met here for the first time in December at a conference of a region as an educational village, and I'm really glad to see the organizers being the same, which is a good example for the Czech environment that the National Pedagogical Institute, sponsored by the Ministry of Education, which means the government, together with the Educational Institute for Moravia, which is an organization uh, organized by the South Moravian region, and Meeting Brno, which is an NGO. Together, all these three created this platform for this sort of meetings. I wanted to point out that education village as a term, uh, where did you find it? <laughs> well, yes, I can explain that. The term uh, originates in an old African saying, which uh, has been uh, a, a global educational pact, which is also a partner of our conference. So if I share the whole saying in, from Africa, Two people are needed to conceive a child, but to educate a child, the whole village is needed. And it seems to us, and we are in line with this, that this can be extended to a br broader units or communities, not only villages, but regions or the whole national state. So if we follow this example of a village and think about what a village life, uh, uh, what holds the village life together, one of those things is that people meet on different milestones during the year. And one of such milestones is the end of the school year. Together we can look back for significant phenomena and also get ready for the summer holiday. Because some people uh, say that you can tell what's important for a person based on how they spend their free time. So thank you for this explanation. We already were criticized uh, on social networks that we shouldn't use the term village and we should use nation or something prouder. So sometimes I call it an educational fish pond instead of village. Uh, you surely meet many people that you know from your professional life but it's still important that we can meet across different platforms to share what happened and so on. To start with, we have to point out that there will be coffee breaks and refreshment. Who prepared that? That's a school, hotel or gastronomy school from Zenets. I don't remember their proper name, but anyway, I really like the fact that the students of this school from the South Moravian region are those who prepare refreshment and coffee for us. And if you read the Global Compact for Education pages, one of the main uh, impacts is the inclusion of young people. They're forming uh, education. So we, we need young people and it's great to see these youngsters among us in this practical way. I also wanted to point out that our conference is a two-part conference. From now until four in the afternoon, there will be f six workshops, and we are going to focus on those professional topics, and then a bus is going to collect us and give us a transfer to the Spielberg Castle, to a summer terrace, where we normally have an open-air cinema. We'll have a more relaxed part, evening part, where we can meet the minister, some of the deputies and other guests, a lot of good food and drink and great music. Yes, so you will have to be uh, at uh, Spielberg Castle at the temperature of 28 
degrees centigrade, you will have good food, but also music of Hazafele and Tonda Bukowski, who's a great violin player. So he, apart from being a winemaker, so this is a taster for coming for the evening. I want to thank everybody who worked on this conference. I don't want to list all of them, but I can see some of the faces. But anyway, let me invite the lady of this house, the manager of this Educational Institute for Moravia, Leona Sapikova. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Education Institute for Moravia at this um, expert conference which is a unique opportunity to meet and also to share experience and ideas. During today, we will be focusing on various topics that have an influence on all on our complete society. And I believe that all those who are active in education um, will find a lot of in inspiration there. Um, and they will also find solutions perhaps for their further um, issues or challenges. Unfortunately, I won't be able to accompany you all day. Uh, which I'm very sorry about because I'm leaving for Brussels where there's a summit on education and innovations and we've got some meetings. Um, so right at the start of the conference, I would like to thank the organizers, firstly and foremostly the National Pedagogical Institute and meeting Bruno for a very pleasant cooperation full of um, trust and respect. I want to also thank the speakers for sharing their knowledge with us and to all of you uh, for joining us today. And I wish you all a very pleasant day here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your words. At this point, I would like to welcome the graduate of uh, Gymnasium Matthias Lercha. So am I here, and also a successful graduate of the Faculty of Law of <laughs> Brno, and also uh, a politician since 2010 who's been trying to work for the benefit of all, now in charge of uh, education in the city of Brno, Mrs. Irena Matonohova. Thank you for such a pleasant uh, welcome. I am truly. Um, trying to manage education in Brno uh, since um, 2010, which means actually 65 primary schools and 137 um, kindergartens with their buildings in the city. It's a beautiful work and I rejoice in it because many things are going well. Unfortunately, nowadays, the journalists and, um, and, and I can't really be angry with them are trying to or are usually tending to point out the bad things, those things that are not going well. But I will focus on the contrary today. I will try to um, emphasize those things that are good. I would like to, I'm going to summarize it in three um, chapters. First of all, there are school buildings that we must renovate. Many of them are in very bad shape. And I will going to, I'm going to tell you what we've managed. Secondly, thanks to massive constructions of uh, housing in various areas, we're also planning the construction of new kindergartens and primary schools. And thirdly, the third area, which actually makes me very happy as well, um, is that we as a city of Brno support the leisure activities of uh, children and youth which is the cherry on top of the cake. The fourth idea or issue actually, which none of us are very happy and we discussed it in the winter, due to the increase of prices of energy, ultimately I did manage to get 110 million crowns for the, our schools, which will be divided between all the schools to cover the energy prices. It's a huge amount. However, I actually wanted much more, I have to admit. And it was, of course, um, a matter of negotiation to coming to an agreement with others. 
Nonetheless, I'm very happy about that, even so, because directors have been quite relieved because none of us were very happy about the situation. When it comes to renovating our schools and kindergartens, the first issue that I have to mention is the number of millions. And then you'll probably realize yourselves that the amounts are quite high. In Brno Hrlice, we have or oh, we're going to be building a new gym. The city of Brno contributes with 40 million crowns. It's a huge amount. In Hrlice, they've decided to actually demolish to demolish the gym, which was in very, very bad shape. And we were really standing in front of a situation of how to resolve this issue very quickly and effectively. And the whole investment and all the um, approvals have taken place in record time and they are already building now. Speaking about gyms, in Tuzhany, another city district of Brno, uh, we have also designed a new gym because children have to walk one kilometer to another gym which is um, not quite suitable. So at Požárně Street, we'll be building another gym, a new gym. When it comes to further investment in our current buildings, I could perhaps mention Bastviny Primary School in Komín. We will be extending the capacity of the dining room, of the cafeteria, Lots of millions again, and I could continue. I'm not quite sure whether this is an interesting topic for you, as I can see, but so many schools and kindergartens that have to be renovated are truly numerous. Nonetheless, I'm going to speak about what's more interesting than just money, um, and I will say what we're planning for the future. We are very close to opening a new pr uh, kindergarten in Bistarz. It was meant to be opened on the 1st of September. Unfortunately, there was a time delay. I think it's not that bad yet. And it will be opened on the 1st of October. There is a tender f to choose a director. It should be a three class kindergarten. We also have huge plans in Sadova, in Kralovo Pole, where there should be a new primary school and kindergarten. They should start the construction next year in the spring. The amounts are so huge, I'm not going to even mention them. But the plans are beautiful. I've seen the winning design, which was uh, chosen from the competition. By the way, the uh, designs were exhibited at Urban Centrum. And if it really works out the way we're hoping, or it should, then the city of Brno will really be able to boast with a beautiful, beautiful school. The primary school should have 18 classrooms and the kindergarten with five classrooms, so a huge place for a lot of children with brilliant facilities. Another huge plan is meant or planned for Nová Zbrojovka, the former factory premises. Again, a completely new primary school and kindergarten with 27 classrooms. <coughs> But the numbers, the figures are huge, a billion pretty much. So we'll see. I'm hoping that they will start the construction in spring next year. And now, after I've um, completely overwhelmed you with uh, figures, I'm coming to the pleasant topic of uh,
children's leisure. We've been supporting Duke of Edinburgh Award. We've had a beautiful event in Prague with the awarding of the events by the Duke of Edinburgh himself. We're supporting the primary schools and secondary schools that have, who have joined this project. And when I've been listening to the pupils and students who've involved themselves in this project, I was almost close to tears. Because it, this is something that we really should support. This is something that leads children to independence, creativity, thinking, because they really have to take up an ex expedition where they have to improvise because they don't know what's ahead of them. It's a beautiful project and I didn't even mention the aspect that the children really have to um, spend some time doing voluntary work. They have to come up with something useful and beneficial for others. They have to think what could help someone and what they could do themselves for others. And that is, in today's world, absolutely indispensable. Another beautiful project is called On Stage, and that is focused on teaching musical instruments in endangered locations or underprivileged locations. We've been spending around 13 million annually on all leisure organizations, including environmental and scout organizations, etc. And uh, the last thing that I would like to mention are the stories of our neighbors. Another beautiful event that encourages children under the leadership of their teachers to find interesting neighbors, people of higher age who have an interesting memory, who have an interesting past, and they have to create a presentation and present their story in front of a full audience. And again, therefore, it teaches the children, the pupils, a lot of things which, from my perspective, at least they were not taught in schools before. So just the very fact that they have to think about contemporary history from the point of view of a person who still remembers them is a huge thing. And the final presentation which is certainly something that they will make use of for the rest of their lives. So I think at this point, I've come to the end of my allocated time. Thank you so much for, the inv for inviting me to this beautiful conference. And I wish you all um, to learn a lot of interesting things and a lovely evening and a lovely time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mrs. Matonohova. Thank you for finishing in this positive uh, notion of informal education. I had the honor <clears throat> to see the sharing, the awarding of golden certificates, and it was wonderful to see their students, how they present their projects and how they enjoy being uh, able to see, see something. They spoke very good English. It was so optimistic to see uh, devoted young people believing that their voluntary activities can change the world. So thank you for mentioning that. <clears throat> and story of our neighbors, that's exactly the way how a community can become a real village, including the educational village, generations finding each other. At this moment, we wanted to welcome Jiří Nantl, the deputy until of the governor of the South Moravian region and also of the Ministry of Education. Unfortunately, we don't, we haven't heard from him. We don't know why he's not around, so he might be late. I uh, joked about saying that if he fails to come, I will say what he would probably say. Anyway, he did a lot in the last six months. He 
called all the councillors for the education and mayors of different villages in the South Moravian region and started discussing with them organizing some sort of like an administration board for the region as an education village. Anyway, let's hope that he will come later on. And <clears throat> if he doesn't come in this morning, he will come in the afternoon because his boss, the minister, will be there. So let's go to the next point, another important personality to make sure that children enjoy the school and the teachers have the best job in the world adds the words of our director Ivo Yupa and I'd like to ask him to share a few words as as Mr. Nantl is not here he's got a little bit more time so he can share more thank you for the possibility to present here and thank you for the repeated experience that I should always speak until Yiri comes that happened last year that he was also late and I was allowed to speak until he comes. I've got loads of stories from my childhood, so I hope that Yiri will come uh, in time so that you don't hear things that you won't, don't want to hear. Anyway, uh, I'll tell you what I believe he would say. So, uh, it, it was funny last time Yiri was here, but now he's uh, much more uh, highly positioned. Being my boss, I shouldn't make fun of him anymore. As to the slogan, so that the children look forward to the school and the teachers have the best job in the world, it came to existence. And by the way, I have to point out that if you heard me speaking previously, you will be surprised that uh, you will hear the same thing. Yeah. I make sure that I will share the same three or four stories that I repeat everywhere, not only for the fact that I don't remember any more stories, but as my colleague says, that a famous psychologist said that all things have to be shared 12 times, that only after 12 times they get reflected in the listeners hearts or brains. So if you heard the stories 10 times, you are almost there. Two more jobs or events and you will understand. <laughs> Unlike my previous speaker, I feel that I'm disadvantaged. I don't have any numbers. Well, I try to say to myself, well, remember at least a number or two. She could share facts. She could share, look here, look there. And when I think about myself and think about look here or look there from the point of view of the National Pedagogic Institute and about the shining eyes of the children, I realized that I haven't seen a child at school for a very, very long time. I believe that they still have their shining eyes, but unfortunately, uh, uh, I can only tell you, imagine, not have a look. But even though it may sound that it's something less important, I have a feeling that this, this imagine or a vision that should guide us forward, it is also important. And I believe it's very important. And for that fact, I believe that our original vision that the children look forward to school and teachers have the best job in the world, it's something that's almost like a pie in the sky, but it came as an inspiration from a friend of mine who managed a large company in the Czech Republic and their mission, that's Alza uh, online shop, and they always came up with a, it's the largest e-shop in the Czech Republic, if you don't know what it is. <clears throat> and they always wanted to come up with a vision and when we sh implemented in the company after a year it was too old so they wanted to come up with something that would be so new that it wouldn't expire and they came up with the idea of saying that order by order by thought and deliver by teleporting 
And then we were thinking about what could be this order by thought and delivery by teleporting in our environment of education. And we thought that the ideal way that wouldn't expire within a year and we will be able to follow it for a long time, that's that the children look forward to school and teachers have the best job in the world. And in this spirit, especially in this year, we focused, all, uh, let me put it in other words, you know that the direct manager or school principal should care about what's happening at school and shouldn't care about what happens with the building and the budget and how people are paid and what their work contracts are and all those practicalities around. So we also have this vision or but as we as an organization are quite young being linked or merged from five different organizations so all those technicalities and links or things linked to the operational agenda they take a lot of our energy and require a lot of our focus more than we would want to but yet i believe that we still have time for redesigning uh, the roles of the regional offices and we think about how to support schools in a not in classical education come to a course listen to to what we tell you and go back to your school but we should support these people through networking good practice and especially uh, having mentors or coaches visiting them and helping them with their own educational or training plans regardless of whether the different parts of the development plan are built of uh, blocks delivered by the National Pedagogical Institute. We don't mind if WIM supplies them or any NGO. We should all go in the same way. The point is not that we do it, but that things happen regardless of who supports them. And in this respect, we would like to focus especially on schools that did not work with us until now. Not for the fact that it's our marketing trick, how to find our own niche, which is still not occupied by us, so to speak, but for the reason that schools that uh, were in contact with us, visited our courses, but those were the schools that needed it the least of all of them because they will be able to recognize the need to uh, ask for help and visit us. And by servicing these schools that were the, the least in need, we sold out our capacity easily. They took all our energy, all our human resources, all our time that we had. So we were, be, we allocated all those of these resources to those schools those that were the least in need but then there are loads of schools that need it a lot you you are facing me like this that i should finish nantle is not here and I, yet i should finish yeah. if david turns with his head to me that's his signal please do finish this is a stand-up uh, morning stand-up show <laughs> But the stand-up comedians are worse paid than I am. Anyway, we want to focus on schools that frequently don't have the capacities, energy or time to ask for help. And they feel like, I don't know anything anyway, and I have to push my way through to the very end. So we will speak a lot about the, our cooperation with the Czech uh, educational inspectorate and we started supporting these schools as part of the national plan of recovery and Tomáš Machalik is here and he's the person who runs this project you can't see him but that's him that just waved and he helps those schools that who need the help especially and in addition to that 
we are interested in the topic of curriculum and you probably all noticed that forming curriculum for basic education and specialized education it's a hot topic in this country everybody is opinionated on that because everybody's gone through some time of education and even though <coughs> we are doing our best there are only few people who wouldn't feel that we are doing it the worst possible way so I believe that we could be even worse in that but we are not going to try that way it's a giant topic or task that takes most of our time and we would like to see the curriculum being reflecting also things that are not only from the area of education and by the way I promised to uh, quotations and I want to tease David so uh, I will speak a little bit more we always spoke about or we like speaking about things that what happens at school it's the subjects the and that's what we focus on we know how to test the knowledge and we are fascinated by that but that's not the most important thing and I frequently ask a question have you, have you ever heard anybody saying that for his personal growth and values in life the fifth or sixth grade played a key role has anybody said anything like that no you haven't heard anybody saying this I can see mr. Humpolik and his former job appell the the head of the free leisure time activities that's probably the largest center in the Czech Republic focusing on children and their free time and providing various services and Milan spoke about the fact that some time ago they had a contest building uh, dwarfs made of plaster with children they had four teams and each team went somewhere to the woods and built their own dwarfs and three of them made those dwarfs it was basically the the leader the coach who did or made those dwarfs and the, the children were not that excited because and the fourth one that made everybody angry it was not dwarfs it was the whole meadow f covered with paint and plaster and everything but the children were excited they were happy they discovered things and that's the charm in it that you never heard and about saying that <clears throat> they were crucially influenced by fifth class but probably there is no one in Lujanki who, who wouldn't say that hasn't experienced something like it in this leisure time uh, center because it's the excitement that the children can have there being led by not much older people than themselves and frequently uh, we have to follow all the rules and we have failed to do this these authentic things focusing on other things than the, just the performance so when it comes to the curriculum that we are going to cre de develop for all levels of education we will have those cognitive performance more accurate than the whole meadow covered by plaster it there will have to be more facts but we hope that we will cover also those intangible things that we tend to forget and I'll try to finish my time with uh, a quotation if you if you want to teach mathematics you have to understand mathematics but you have to understand the children or if you want to teach Jimmy a math you have to understand Jimmy so if we f succeed in this I'll be happy and I don't mind if I don't build anything and I don't know loads of numbers thank you
Thank you very much, Ivo. And we are glad that the Erkan uh, failed this time. We, we would be already be behind. So now we are doing fine with time. We are in the same group, David Ivo, and myself. We were in Liverpool visiting a unique school, Liverpool College, being led by a significant principles and we have the privilege of meeting him here but before we do that i'll tell you a few words about that institution it's interesting in, by the fact that they start with children from the age of four they have 17 build uh, 37 buildings so we wouldn't be able to see that all because the campus is enormous and we would uh, And that's the topic of what he's going to talk about, the, uh, the curriculum, what the changes were, how they approach it, and how to make sure that it's not only on the paper, but also lived at the school. And that's what he are going, he's going to share. Děkuji moc krát. Je pro mě velkou ctí být tady dneska s vámi a po tomto uvedení mám pocit, že se měl zůstat sedět, protože cítím jakýsi tlak, abych vám řekl o všech těch úžasných věcech, když ve skutečnosti stejně jako ředitel, každý ředitel si kontrolují telefon, jestli mi někdo nepíše, o nějakých problémech ve škole, nebo jestli se tam neděje zrovna nějaká katastrofa, tak jak to řeší každý ředitel. Takže ještě jednou, Liverpool College je škola pro 17 žáků. Je 180 let stará, ale před deseti lety, v roce 2013, se změnila z takzvané veřejné školy, což vlastně znamená v anglické terminologii, musíte, že musíte platit 1300 liber za školní rok a my jsme se spíše rozhodli požádat ministerstvo školství, aby nám umožnilo ty poplatky zrušit a financovat nás z poloviny a otevřít školu všem dětem v Liverpoolu. Takže Liverpool College je škola, na kterou se hlásí úplně nejvíc dětí. Máme 91 míst každý rok a 1700 dětí se hlásí do loterie, ve které se snaží, skrze kterou se snaží na tuto školu dostat. A máme děti, které u nás vlastně bydlí, tak říkajíc. Rád bych trochu mluvil dneska o tom, o jedné části té cesty, kterou jsme ušli a rozhodně ta cesta není ještě dokončená. Myslím si, že by bylo užitečné, abych se podělil o to, o co se pokoušíme a co jsme se po cestě naučili. Takže to, co bych tady teďka promítl, je to, co najdete i u nás na webu. V roce 2015 vláda požádala po každé škole, aby si zpracovala kurikulum a vystavila ho na webové stránce. Toto je jenom jedna stránka a za tímto kurikulem 
je asi 180 plánů na hodiny i angličtiny, kapitola číslo 8, znamená, že dětem je zhruba 12-13 let a my jsme si tuto práci dali, abychom zpracovali v, té, v tomto věku 15 různých předmětů, samozřejmě anglický jazyk. Vidíte zde, jak tedy to kurikulum vypadá. Toto samozřejmě zpracovali učitelé. The quality of that is very heavily inspected in our country. We are a very regulated education system. And an inspector would expect to see when they come into our school that even just in that one year with that one group of children, what we are trying to do in our teaching of English is very, very carefully developed. Step by granular step. Step by granular step. And you can see, this is just the summary sheet. Um, and, you know, as, as a head teacher, uh, I had nothing to do with this. <laughs> uh, I, I marveled at it when it was made. I thought, this is just, who are these fantastic people that can make a curriculum like this? And all this paper was there. And really what I want to talk about today is, is what happened then. You know, you've, you've made the curriculum. You, you have it on paper. You have all the lessons that sit uh, underneath it. Uh, now, what is, what is actually going to happen? And the question that I posed at the top there, you know, is, is very interesting. It occurred to me when Ivo and I were walking over here, we were using our phones. No one would ever look at a piece of paper like that and say, that is a piece of technology. Um, But actually, if you think technology is simply the application of scientific knowledge for repeatable results, that, that is technology. Uh, it occurred to me, as the head of the school, actually, we are dealing with a piece of technology. We have uh, created something that we call a curriculum, which is actually a piece of technology that we've just made together. We've made a machine because The idea very, very much is any child goes into that and out come the English skills at the end of that particular year. So I would argue, just as when we were walking through here, Eva, walking through Bruno together in the morning, Ivo said, you know, one of the most amazing things is that I'm just looking at this, I'm looking at this map here on Google Maps and I'm no longer looking at the city. I don't really know where I am anymore. I am simply walking to the destination of the talk because I made, I obtained a technology that enabled me to get there. So it occurred to me, actually, this just shows you how useless I am to my colleagues because they did all this work and I said, but you've made a piece of technology. You made some technology. Um, is it a theory? It's also a theory. Uh, yes, it's based on the experience of particular people, but every single thing you see there is based on particular theories about particular kids, the kind of kids we're going to have, um, and where we need to get to. And it's also an expression of practice. It's an expression of practice because the people who made the curriculum are actually the teachers who are going to teach it, and this particular piece is informed by their work. And uh, this is Marshall McLuhan, Medium is the Message. Uh, I, began, I began to get more and more nervous the more I thought about it. Um, because we, we know one thing, when we make a tool, first we make the tool and then the tool begins to make us. We don't particularly think like, okay, we've made this tool, Uh, and, and, and now it's done, we, we are, remain in control of the tool. No, the curriculum begins, in a sense, to take control of us. And then there were other excellent examples. Warren Buffett is the most successful investor, uh, I think, in the United States over the last 60 years. And uh, every economist says that it won't work. So he does something, it works. And their people at Harvard cannot get the theory 
to match what he does. It's not supposed to work, but it does work. Um, and in fact, it works better than all the theories that they've made. And I thought that that's something that I need to think about because, um, you know, what, what does this mean? Now, this is a guy, you won't know this person unless you're a baseball fan. And as you can tell from my accent, I was not born in Liverpool. I got there as fast as I could. Um, this is Yogi Berra. He was a New York Yankees catcher. He was famous for saying things that appeared to contradict themselves. He made no sense, but he does make sense. Uh, you know, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there is. So, what, what, what does this mean about this thing, this piece of technology that we are publishing on our website, that all the teachers are talking about? Uh, what's going to happen next? Is this technology going to shape us, or are we going to continue to shape uh, the curriculum? Uh, also uh, expressed, you know, in the town of theory, everything is possible. I live in practice. Uh, let's be perfectly honest. Uh, the great danger of any conference like this is there's no child sitting right there. You know, even if you look around, we can... Uh, that's why I... I, I you're, you're very lucky because I get lots of invitations to give talks like this and I never take them. So I, I, I wanted to meet my friends again and was happy to go to Brunel. And also, I'm very happy to do it because you can avoid the mistakes that our country makes. I can't uh, affect the, the infrastructure of the way our country has developed curriculum. But you are at a different stage of thinking about that together. And so you go to the places where your words may still uh, have some impact when they have no impact uh, other than sharing this experience. So what, what happens? Well, here, is the, the, here are some key questions. Uh, that we typically don't uh, ask ourselves. Um, I've, I've talked a lot about number one, I think, but number two is very, very important as well. You know, when you have a, when you're talking about curriculum, there, there, it seems to me there are two fundamental approaches that that the government or the policymakers take. One is an approach of compliance. Right. I'm a teacher, are you following this curriculum? No, you are not. You are therefore doing something wrong. You're in trouble. We need to get uh, better middle leadership to make sure that the curriculum is actually being taught exactly as we planned it. The regulator is obsessed that the curricula are not being taught. And you have this entire compliance culture where people see the curriculum as a, uh, not only a piece of technology, which they're keeping their head down, they're looking at the curriculum, they're following the curriculum. But they also experience uh, the implementation of the curriculum as an act of compliance. They are being uh, asked to comply, as opposed to the curriculum as something that we share uh, that is a responsibility. You know, the, the, the fundamental heart of an educator is the heart of responsibility. I respond to children. I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility. And then finally, uh, just trying to subvert completely the idea of the curriculum as a piece of technology or as an ideology or anything of the kind. You know, uh, Evo showed me a clip from a Czech movie. And we were in the car and he was illegally handing me, I'm sure, his phone. He said, you got to watch this. And it was a clip. Uh, I think you will all know the phrase, look out for the man with the leather bag or stop the man with the leather bag or get the man with the leather bag. And I want you to go into that scene because place yourself there as the children. Uh, the teacher is the policy maker. You know, he's totally bought into the ideology, basically. But what, what we're looking at there is the ultimate experience of humanity meeting ideology. And here is somebody who, through ideology, is literally 
describing how he shot down the postman twice. Uh, you know, because he's looking for the man with the leather bag. That's it. I've got to look for the man with the leather bag. And over time, when you look at the faces of the children, there is something in our humanity that completely rebels against that. Uh, and what, what is interesting from an educational perspective is that the ideology prevented uh, the man who was telling the story to see in the faces of the children uh, really their horror. The, the, the fact that this in no way uh, coincided uh, with their actual experience. So very quickly, I told my team that this curriculum, we, 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 yes, it's good. Yes, we have to have it. Uh, yes, it will make the school a lot better, but we now have to take the next step because without pedagogy, there is no curriculum. Right? The, 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 the curriculum actually is the pedagogy plus uh, the content uh, sheets. And what is the pedagogy? The pedagogy has to start from an anthropology of learning. What is a human person? Who is a teacher? What is happening here? And if we don't get the uh, pedagogy in our own mind correct, so what is not published at all on any website, because the government doesn't care about this. You know, you have to realize that uh, perhaps we don't have a minister who would shoot a postman twice. But uh, the ideology is just as gripping, it's just as strong, it's just as intense, it's just as certain. He, they are just as certain uh, about everything. They are completely unopen-ended, okay? And we discovered these things, and I would say to you, without these three things, your curriculum uh, means very little. Uh, the first thing we learned is that if you cannot relate the specific to the totality of meaning, there will be no affectivity for the learning and there will be no learning. So <clears throat> I'm, if I'm unable to explain or invite a, uh, anything that I'm trying to teach a person, without relating it to the totality of the meaning of their lives, it's not going to work. That is technology, ideology, it's a bust, it's a flush. The children will not respond, and what you're doing there is creating a factory where you will need ever, ever higher levels of energy just to get them to do anything at all. So the first order of business was, it's one thing to have a curriculum, but if we don't have a pedagogy of meaning, if we're not interested in explaining to the child what this means, okay? Meaning is, how does this pertain to my desire to understand and be involved in everything? So you've got to have that. And we never wrote this down. I'm sharing you with, with you our secret. In some respects, the curriculum can be published, the government can look at it, but this little list is the most important thing, okay? So the, the second is a little bit related to the first. Make them see, start with their experience. You know, you can make a, a disembodied curriculum. You can have a curriculum that is about knowledge in completely theoretical or abstract ways. Or you can say, at every age group, we have to start with their experience and we have to adjust to their experience. And then thirdly, and this is perhaps the worst thing we do in England. I don't know if it's because of Bertrand Russell or our terrible. You have a much more beautiful uh, philosophical and literary tradition than we do. And uh, you have to keep that because not all subjects should be approached in the same way. One of the things that curriculum does is everybody says, here's the thing they've got to learn. Here are the techniques they've got to learn it, and what you will find is you will start making everything exactly the same. This is so bad in England that if you go to an art class, it's kind of taught like chemistry. You know, people are like, use these paints, so mix them together, then you do this, then you get these points, then you get, you know, it just, it just takes over. This way of thinking takes over. You, what you get when you allow the curriculum to become the focus 
is scientism. What, what you get is the belief that there is a scientific way of approaching every single subject. What is realistic is to say everything we're studying has its own reasonableness. I'm not going to teach art the way that I teach chemistry. I'm not going to teach philosophy and religion the way that I teach maths. Each discipline has its own method of reasonableness. And that always gets lost when people start thinking about curriculum. They never, ever, ever, ever stop and say, wait a minute. Because right? the machine cranks up. You know, this, we got to get this done. We got to get this going. And politicians, with all due respect, you have beautiful politicians who talk about children and buildings, but they're all the same. They can't possibly be any different here than they are elsewhere. And the, the issue there is they do live in theory. They don't live in practice. Uh, and they're not philosophers, with some very notable exceptions. Uh, they, and, and it's good that they're there, because we should be held to account. I'll speak to that later. I, I appreciate having a, a, a societal accountability. It makes me a better principal and a teacher, and I welcome that. But the idea that these people uh, who want outcomes, see, when you want outcomes, you are likely to always pursue whatever will get you a measurable outcome. So now I'm teaching art, and I'm saying, that child got 88 out of 120 points because of the use of their left hand on this paintbrush. Right? You, it, it will get uh, to that level if you don't watch out. Okay, compliance is a massive problem. You, you're not there yet, I think. I, I haven't visited many Czech schools, but I'm happy to say you have a much more devolved thing, and you should fight to keep that. Because again, once the politicians get started, they will create systems of compliance. They, this is power. Right? So schools should do this, should do that. You should be doing this, you should be doing that. Prove to me that you're doing these things. And we, we needed to find a way to get away from that. And the answer there is expectations. Expectations are different from goals. You know, it is much easier to take a group of people and say, in your heart, what do we expect from each other and what do we expect from the children? What do we expect in art? What do we expect? What is our expectation? What we do know from the best educational research is that the expectation of parents and of teachers are probably the single most important indicator of educational progress and success. So to educate yourself to keep having higher expectations of yourself and of your children is a more effective means of curriculum implementation than anything else. And then finally, a culture of open communication. Um, you know, ministers order, principles follow. Right? And that's fine because the, you know, I can handle the minister and I can handle the compliance. What you don't want is, or what you do want is a situation where the youngest teacher in the school can come up to you and say, you know, our curriculum does not work. I, I live in practice, not in theory. Right? You may be trying to do this. You may think this is a really good project. You may think that we should do this and once a month do that or we go to the woods and we teach them to make dwarfs or we do whatever we want to do. When the teacher says it doesn't work, that's true. That, that is true. That, that is different. We start from that. So there has to be, uh, and what we discovered is that we've got to change the curriculum all the time. And we empower uh, people quite low in the organization to get onto the website and change the curriculum. We're not doing that again, ever, because it doesn't work. <clears throat> Finally, leadership. Uh, our country has gone through an amazing uh, transformation, I think, in education. And I was privileged enough to know the man who was the architect behind it. I think it took more than a decade. 
So uh, England, for example, was in internationally, the children were 23rd in reading. This year, they're fourth in the world. So, you know, the, 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 I don't want to make too much fun of these ministers because they did actually decide these are things that we think are important and they were able to bring them about. What did these uh, architects say? He said, he was a very clever man, Oxford professor. He said, I studied uh, the education in our country. I studied all the schools, I studied all the curricula. And you know what, I'm totally uninterested. The only thing that I knew would really change it is if we changed the culture of leadership in the school. If we were prepared to pay the leader of the school, like any major leader, and if we then said to the leader, you have autonomy, you have freedom within limits uh, to drive this. This is why I work in England, because I, I, love that, I love that approach. And we must not, because we're leaders ourselves, we mustn't, in a way it's very humbling. You know, you are. If you're a leader in a school, you are one of the key, all research shows, the key, key factor. This is so intense in England that they take the best school leaders and bring them to the worst schools. They literally pay a lot of money to move these people into the socioeconomic situations where education is not working for children. So in the end of the day, right, it's about these guys right here. Um, it is not about uh, the, the, um, the, the thing that I'm most concerned about in my school is the level of the relationships in the school. Because a curriculum, if you have a relationship with the curriculum, you are unlikely to have a relationship with each other. Right? So you have, it's a little bit like this phone at my family's dinner table. Right? So if we use the analogy where you are sitting down with your wife or husband or partner and your children are there and everybody's on their phone. Right? Is that family going to do well? Is that going to work? I think not. So when we make that, when we fetishize that curriculum, when we make that our phones, when we use that as a piece of technology, we forget that very, very fundab fundamentally, okay, uh, it's relationship to knowledge and to others, and you have to make the space and the structure and the time in your school to make it about that. Now, I'll never leave you without how we did that, like because it's a super simple. It's so easy that when, of course, I did not think of this. But, and that's the other beautiful thing about education. There are no copyrights. Right? We, you steal whatever idea you want from wherever you want it, and you just take it. And it's very simple. Somebody pointed out to me, Hans, you go visit all these lessons at the school. You go in there with your clipboard, and you look at that teacher, and you, you coach them a little bit. And they said, you see all the good teaching. but you're already a good teacher. Does it really matter that you see the good teaching? Would it not be better if the teachers saw each other teaching? So now, instead of me going to watch teaching, my team and I go to the classrooms of people who are teaching. They have 15 minutes and they go watch a friend teach. There's no paper. There's no clip, there's no record. After the 15 minutes, they go wait outside in the hallway and they talk to each other about what they saw. They discuss only two things. What were the expectations? What did I see that I liked? Right. And what did I learn? And we do that every day, three times a day. So uh, the good news there is that in the 15 minutes that I'm in your lesson, I learn a lot about how you are teaching uh, because when I'm there, uh, inev inevitably there's some work being done or something's being discussed and I get an opportunity to talk to the students and the teachers get an opportunity to talk to each other. So the model that we've decided on is what I would call cultural expectational change. 
by talking constantly with each other about the actual practice of the implementation of the curriculum, we are able to create a culture of openness where the youngest person and the newest person has just as much influence and just as much voice as the most senior person, where managerialism is gone and everybody is a leader because everybody is talking about this teaching. Where are we in the curriculum there? You can do it by subject, but the ideal situation we want is that people visit other subjects. That they see the pedagogy of other subjects and they see other people teach. They have a quick discussion, no paperwork, no judgment, no judgment, no outcome, no curriculum, really. No technology, just that relationship. And uh, that is what we learned. Now, I'm telling you something that we learned over eight years in the hopes that you don't have to go through eight years of hell. And you could say, well, that, he told us that that was never going to work, and it's never going to work. Right? Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what uh, we, we, these are the posters that we put up around school, Purpose, Passion, Challenge. We, we ask our teachers and our pupils all the time, this, these are, this is the expectation. This is the expectation that we just want to share all the time. Right? The purpose is the meaning bit. Uh, the passion is it starts from my own experience. So this has been translated for the kids. <laughs> if you say to kids, I want a pedagogy that starts with your own experience, they say, all right, purpose, passion, challenge. Up the expectation. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very specific, practical and experience-based presentation. Before we open the floor for questions, I would also like to ask our very special guest who's come from Bratislava, especially Pragers appreciate this. So, dear neighbor from Bratislava, Director for Curricula and Innovation at the Slovak Ministry of Education, Science, Innovation, Sports and who knows what else, our friend Martin Kriš. Let's hear some Slovak. And we've asked Martin to react from his own perspective and based on his own activities um, to what he's just heard from Hans and tell us his view. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? I can't hear it myself really, but first of all, perhaps you won't believe Mr. Matzek or don't believe Mr. Matzek that I've come from Bratislava. It's, I might look like as I've just emerged from the um, forest where my robber's wife and son are waiting just in the parking lot for me. I look like this famous bearded um, cartoon character. What can I say about uh, what are we feeling? A Slovak poet, Jan Kolar, said that we carry our country, our homeland, in our heart. And in my heart, uh, my country begins with Brno and ends with Trenčín, because my grandmother was born in Kralovo Pole, a district of Brno, where she met a Slovak student from Trenčín, with whom she wanted to leave for Slovakia, but then it was already complicated because it was March 1939. So it was some sort of escape without marriage. And that's what my, that's where my mom comes from. And my father comes from a family which came from a village 
uh, called Kopchani, which is right across the border with Hodonin. So if you say that Masaryk was born in Hodonin, you're going to basically get um, a hay fork in your back. And well, in any case, my grandfather came from Chekovice in Moravia yet again. So I'm half Moravian, half Slovak, really. So that's my emotional bond to this area. And when I've been wandering through Brno before I got here, I figured, yes, I should come here because I'm losing my orientation in this marvelous city. So anyway, let's um, talk about what we are here for. Education. We've heard this fantastic presentation with a lot of marvelous ideas that speak about how one good school can function in this case by coincidence in Great Britain, but the, th the thoughts we had are universal. I'm going to speak a little about what we do in Slovakia and I'll try to perhaps to present a connection with what we've heard in the previous lecture. Seeing the nice motto so that children look forward to going to school and teachers have the best job in the world. The reform that we are trying to bring to practice in Slovakia has a motto that says we are learning to think independently and act responsibly based on values, knowledge and data. And every line of this motto has its meaning and it's answering a question reacting to what is happening in our country in a connection with education. In Slovakia, we have very weak results. I don't know how about the Czechs, I think you're higher in this sense. We have relatively weak results, subpar level. We've been tr struggling and improving it and we've tried to solve it by adding lessons, reading, math, science, etc. But when you look at the statistics, we have more lessons where children should learn reading with understanding and we still have subpar results. When you, we've got a great um, MP, he's a tennis player and so he pushed for three hours of gym class. The only subject where the, the MPs have actually fixed it already in the law. So if one school, if some school wants to have less gym class per week, the parliament is going to have to decide on that. Um, well, those are just the silly things. So more lessons of something do not help. Children, children do not exercise in the class, they sit on the bench on the side and if we want to solve the problem we add lessons. So now we're going to sit through three gym classes, not two. Oh, how we've improved it. So adding classes doesn't add. We have to make sure that learning takes place in the lessons. And when I'm telling teachers, they all go like, oh, aha, really? Um, you're laughing and, and, I, and it's not embarrassing at all. And don't tell me it's different though. You're looking at what you're supposed to teach. You look at the curriculum that is presented on the page. But when you ask the teacher how much time you spend in class that there is learning going on in your students heads it's not an easy question and we're not used to asking this so the, that's why the first line of our motto says are we learning question mark in brackets because even the teachers should ask themselves whether they are learning I sometimes feel I still I can still remember what it feels like being in third grade I'm still a third grader in my head sometimes so do we find out whether the learning is taking place and what do we do in order to make sure that it does take place to think independently and act responsibly 
not history, optics, negative figures, etc. No, think and act. This should be above all of those topics that may be contained in the curriculum. So let us ask these questions. And I have an example. Today, in the existing curriculum that we're going to change, there is a standard that says that pupils, the pupil is supposed to learn how to reason and explain what the difference is between a farmer and a workman or a craftsman. It's, that's not stupid, but what does the teacher read? Teacher reads, okay. So in order to make sure that the teacher, that the pupil has to say, be able to say this, I'm going to explain very carefully what are the reasons of dividing farmers and craftsmen as well as I can and if I'm a good teacher and I have clever pupils then for the test they will know how to say what were the reasons of dividing farmers and craftsmen but after all those four steps that I've just mentioned the division craftsmen farmers and, but the sentence begins with a verb, explain, and the the, um, the meaning has lost, has been lost. Can I, am I able to present the reasons or am I supposed to, or am I able to justify? So dear friends, these are verbs. The pupils are meant to learn what is expressed through a verb, to think, to act. That's the important thing. And then comes the third line based on knowledge, values and data. And that's where the nouns come, in play, come into play that we normally notice. So we're learning to think independently and act responsibly based on values, knowledge and data, which is, by the way, also important because we are hoping that people will think without having some knowledge. Uh, we have one Slovak singer who likes the fact that uh, Earth is flat or the, 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 the idea that Earth is flat and she just sort of spreads the idea and she likes the idea of flying over flat Earth and it's good. When a pupil knows that what I know should actually be connected with what I think and what I think should be connected with what I do. But is this new? Is something new? Is it something new? I looked at some strategic documents that were drafted even in, back in Czechoslovakia, some in Slovakia, 1990. It was called the Spirit of the School, 1992. It was then called the Constantine Project, 19, 2017, Learning Slovakia. In all of these, I found this content. It was in the documents. But when they measure it, it still doesn't work. We're still subpar in OECD. And we're definitely below the level that we would wish for ourselves. This is a second attempt where we're trying to transfer this into practice. The first attempt was in 2008 and the second attempt is coming now with the um, plan of renewal and resilience. And we keep working on it. It's an open end. The end, it says we should finish by two 2026, but I think it's just going to go on. We would like to do different things in some ways, in some areas where that we did in 2008. In 2008, we wrote a new law on education that enabled us to do some things. It opened space for those who were more ready, more prepared. It, it um, defi defined the um, curriculum framework programs, then it also stipulated 
the state educational program should be a framework which means not into detail and it says that at the end of some sort of segment of education level class etc the pupil should know this and this and then some educational standards with verbs were added so those were the changes perhaps focused on achievement were added then if we took two ten teachers scientists and closed them in one room and we said that we wouldn't feed them until they come up with a common definition of a content standard and definition and we would probably come to ten funerals and we wouldn't have a definition we call it achievement standards in a buffered way so it might be possible in theory or not but then it works so the law and also the national or framework framework educational program contains some things and yet not quite in the classrooms it, it does exist and does work in some classrooms some classes some schools but in all of Slovakia, on average, it still doesn't work. It still didn't get out of the forest. So what are we saying that we want to do differently now is that we are not going to look at the document or what we write into the document. We will look into the classrooms. What changes in the classrooms? And we have to see what changes in the classrooms. We're not going to write a document and it's not going to be us at the Ministry and the National Edu Institute of Education and Youth. We can't make the changes. I can't go even through the schools, all of the schools in Bratislava, let alone all the classrooms. What is our task as state institutions to enable and to support. We have we enabled something in 2008, but we lack the support. Now we focus on supporting. We rewrite the state educational program uh, to not to be able to overlook the verbs, but uh, especially if I don't know the verbs are important. But anyway, but. That's the smaller part of our job. The biggest, bigger part of our job is to support. We have to focus on supporting people reading what's written in the document and we try to implement that. And that's similar to what my colleague spoke about, the responsibility and compliance. Sometimes we say do not make us responsible how this reform succeeds we only create conditions we as the government or the state we won't tell you how to do it because we are not experts in my own teaching career i had the, the privilege of teaching one day on bilingual grammar school in bratislava for one day and the remaining four days I, I taught in Gelnica, a town. Who knows where Gelnica is? No one. <laughs> so that says everything. <laughs> we call it a hungry valley. <laughs> there is, it's about 400 kilometers away from each other. There's no point that the same method will work in Bratislava and Gelnica. I had to teach completely differently in those two different schools. We want to see, get a list and I wanted to teach the same on Monday and Tuesday. No, it wouldn't work. It might work on one school, but not on both. Most likely it won't work on either. So sometimes we transfer that on the teachers do search we've got a certain pointers some expectations but you have to find what's the best for your school and we will support you since 2008 all the good that we would like to see is happening somewhere else 
it just happens on islands, sort of islands. And one of the forms of our support should be that let us show you where people can give good examples. It's not doesn't mean that I w I'm going to say that this school works well with forming character of stu students and it's excellent uh, didactically or in their teaching style, but they are good at this. So look at them, how they do it. And another school is good at something else. Let's have a look at there is an NGO that cooperates with this school and they developed a great program. And that's the idea of the education village. Let's share the good practice and don't prescribe the schools what they should start with. Each school can have a different situation. They might be one step away from the change. Sometimes they have teachers that are great researchers, but they are not very good at training the character or educating the character. Start with what they need. There might be a school that they have a perfect, uh, perfect equipment with schools, but for teachers who can teach it. So let's start with digital transformation. Don't prescribe them what to do. Let's share good practice and spread the good word. Another thing that was not done in 2008 and what what caused people uh, having heavy GBs when they hear the word reform. There's a law educational program and let's start teaching according to the new program starting in September. Some of them didn't smile or laugh at that. The minister said, well, I'm the one who introduced the reform very quickly. But what the teachers they saw the reform, the well re rewriting PDFs into Word documents, and that was their perception of the reform. This is not the key. We have to give time to all the parties involved to start uh, with the school year 23, 24. Schools can start implementing the new uh, educational program but others can join later on until 2026 when it becomes compulsory for everybody. And we are not expecting the results in 2026. That's what the uh, media want to hear. This is this, that the date when the reform will finish? No, it won't be finished. It will just mean that the schools will start using it. But the fact that we learn to think uh, independently and bear responsibility, I would say that my estimate is 2035 when we see the results. But in order to see the results in 2035, we need to start tomorrow with the first changes because it's a long term process. So what do we do in particular? We've got three interventions that we introduce within this reform. Number one, we rewrite the state educational program and create a new one. I believe that there are two benefits to that. Those standards focusing on thinking and doing will be more visible and we will write the program to comply with the law. Yes, the law says that the state should specify the uh, the outcome level but in reality we had all the all the content of the teaching so not only the results so the state education program needs to be just a framework n nothing more detailed in similar to what the principal from the uk said uh, Oh, no, 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 there was the, the other speaker who said that we cannot do it any worse than we do it. <laughs> I, on the contrary, I believe that the resources we, that we have, we can't do any better. Let's be happy with what we have. But the document is not the reform. The reform must happen in the classrooms and the document only enables that. Do I or can I imagine a better educational program? Yes, I can. Do I know how to achieve it in our Slovak conditions? No, I don't. Number two, what we want to do, a catalog of innovations in education. 
there are many good things that happen, but there is a high percentage of principles that will never try them, because in 1972 they had an inspector at their school and they were criticized for this and that and it would contradict the innovation so we will play it safe because it's not being blessed from the ministry and what if an inspector comes well my first reaction is what was your teacher's dream to teach children or to make the inspector happy but if you are afraid of an inspector we'll give you a tool we will create a catalog of innovations that will be blessed from the ministry, so to speak, to, and that will say that it's not dangerous and you are allowed to use it. And you can go for it. So we're going to tr support the innovation potential this way. We haven't reached very far. Uh, we can say that we have this formal and now we are working on the public processing to make it available for everything. It's a painful process. I didn't know much about that before I start. And I sort of weep that since 2020, I never reached the level of the public administration of this portal. And I, the only thing I can say, it would be wonderful to have it, but we don't. Number three, what we do, and it's similar to what I heard previously here, and at the same time it's completely different. We've got regional centers of supporting of teachers. We divided the country into 40 regions, like two districts to one area that we have, political districts, I mean. So we have these regional centers. We already have 16 of them, and in September 16 more will start working. And that's exactly uh, about what we want. We want three things, that all regions will start knowing the town of Gelnica, the middle of nowhere, which is always on the last spot in all kinds of measuring of, by the government. And if we present the fantastic schools in Bratislava and Kosice, nothing will happen in Gelnica. We need to start the motion in all regions, developed and undeveloped. We need to run it from local sources. And the first task of these centers is to create regional networks to increase the quality of education. These networks should include schools, companies, NGOs, administration, governmental bodies, universities to a certain extent, and so on. And the one who runs the center is responsible for creating this center to make it sort of a village that will assist in improving the situation. The second thing is that the regional centers should employ pedagogic leaders uh, at half time. The second half still has to be teaching. We don't want to pull them out of the schools so that they don't end up uh, in a, such a situation like me, who doesn't know what a student look like, looks like. Uh, so the experts will get only half-time job. They will get intensive education and support so that they can be leaders of changes in their regions. So we work with them, but they also have certain tasks and their tasks or main task is the support other teachers that does, that's the third function when teacher says i've been to a training session they showed me how to uh, teach research but uh, in our village it doesn't work in our village my students won't cope with that but if we send someone who knows how to approach it let's say from from Smolnik, which is another village in the neighborhood but a little bit more successful and together they may come up with the idea what about trying this or that so the answer is not only this doesn't work we want to start them so to speak to give them a kickstart 
I, I probably didn't respond to what you wanted to hear, but I definitely wasted your time. <laughs> so I hope that I, I'm not going to use your strength as much as I used your time. <laughs> so time for questions and answers. Thank you very much. You almost use all the time for the break. <laughs> so we can't have any time for questions and answers, but you will get a chance to ask anything during the break or perhaps afterwards. So I also want to thank everybody for speaking about inspection of teaching. Do we have Tomáš that local here who's the central inspector of educational? I can't see his face here, but I hope that he will share a little bit of the good practice when he, when the inspector supports schools. So let's run the coffee break until 10 past 11. So let's make it 25 minutes so that you get a chance to meet our guests, ask them questions. Martin Krish will have to go to Bratislava at around lunchtime. So use Martin and Hans will stay with us until the end of the day. So if you've got priorities, go for Martin because he has to leave. I want to thank publicly to two people who are going to meet on Saturday at the presentation of the book of Risks of Education. It'll be interpreted by Gabriela Tibenska, who's the head of the foundation uh, who recommended Martin Krish, and I hope or I guess that she was right, recommended Martin. What I like is your your heart that glows from everything that you say. The same applies to Hans. I need to thank Delcio Delfina and Gabriela will interpret for him on Saturday. So everything is linked together among these people. So this was my advertise, advertising for the Saturday event. So let's go for coffee. Thank you. Decentralized system, uh, school principals have high level of autonomy and responsibility in all these areas. Work safety, legal, finances, operation, HR and so. And apart from teaching, we want that such a person to be a leader of other teachers because that person needs to have information of what's happening in his or her school, what sort of problems his or her teachers deal with, what support they would need. So this is just what all the or selective things that the principal should do. So they have several layers above them that somehow influence his or her the performance, not really coordinated, and he or she has to sort of balance out all these influences, sometimes supported from one side or having no support from any side, but he or she is the key person without whom nothing can happen in the school. This can be seen in our results of analyzing criteria based on the support of teachers and management schools. We can see that more than half of the schools would need a support in this area. The support does not come. The support of the principal needs to be found by the principal himself or herself, or if they fail to find it, then they have to go through their intuition. For that reason, we wanted to give a focused support to principals directing to the areas where they needed most. And now we are talking about the pedagogic leadership based on the complex educational audit, which means an insight of what's happening in the school to identify the strengths, weaknesses of the school, we have certain criteria through which we can evaluate individual uh, performances of the school. There are 26 of them, so the evaluation is very accurate, able to identify uh, difficult points directly and accurately. We have a four-step 
educational range, then each of them is an opportunity for further development and support of the school. The support from our point of view is not for those who are just behind and have difficult uh, serious problems, even though it's also for them. But it's also an opportunity for everybody else. And schools can be supported even if they are great in certain area, because they can become an inspiration for others. So if it's very good if I can contact someone who had to deal with a similar problem and succeeded. That's a great thing to be in touch with someone like that. So we've been talking about a pedagogic leadership, but we know that an important part of the whole agenda of a principal is also all the personal administration, financial and legal aspects. And in order to create the space for the pedagogical leading of a teacher, we have to support the principals in these activities. Well, this is what we call the middle uh, uh, part of the support. Yet our goal is to create conditions so that the ministry knows that all the measures and strategies that have the competencies for to see, to get a feedback how they work or don't work. What would be the indicators if it doesn't work or these things don't work? correctly. Then we have other institutions like the National Pedagogical Institute, which is not only the curriculum institute, but plays its role in its methodological support of schools. For that reason, we opted for this model that I showed, that based on an educational audit, we identify individualized and focused support in the area where the school has a great opportunity for transferring or improvement. We don't have many uh, expert capacities. That's something we uh, experienced in the North Bohemian region, the former Sudetenland, uh, where, which are typically problematic. We, we gave them various templates, but they couldn't find people who would be able to follow them. The same is true of the supports of principals in the personal development and professional development such as implementation of changes that he or she would like to introduce. And so we wanted to test these uh, things in a pilot project in the last three years, Karlovy Vary, Plzeň and Ústí regions. And the feedback that we got from individual schools, and I'm talking about this pilot, so that's just a few schools. So. This is the feedbacks from principals, how they perceived the impact. And these were principals that did not volunteer for anything. And that makes a big difference uh, from all other projects that historically happened, because these used to be run with principals who, that we identified had the potential, potential. Many of them did not understand why something was offered to them. Many of them were convinced we are a great school, we don't need any support. So, so it was not principals who would register as volunteers, but those that we identified that should go for it. And for that reason, we are going to use many of them in further pilots because they might be the good carriers of the experience towards further principals. Everything is based on volunteer, voluntary uh, participation. The benefit uh, to this, for the schools is also for, it's beneficial also for us, not only for schools. And the benefit for us is the change of the ac type of activities. Because if we send inspectors who just judge how successful or unsuccessful the school is, what's good, what's bad. But they now have to think about what sort of support we should provide, uh, what, what form, uh, what it should focus on. So it's a little bit like extension of our competency of our inspection teams. And also we formulate our recommendations, which is something that uh, schools can work with. 
and it also requires more from us uh, that uh, we further work with our recommendations. The pilot number three ran for three years, and this is the first uh, year when it runs in all 14 regions of our country. Now we obviously struggle with various problems, but in order to eliminate these problems, we focus especially on the area of pedagogical leadership, because that's an area where we have certain regional capacities, I mean experts in the regions who can support uh, principals. And what's important that all levels of education are included, the preschool, basic uh, education and secondary education. It's all based on the comprehensive audit, but also based on various complaints that we have to deal with. When, it, when we realize that it would be better, uh, good to help the school to communicate internally. Most of the complaints that we receive are based on communication failing within the school like between teachers, teachers versus parents, teachers and the principal. And if we help as mediators, we frequently solve the problem without uh, dealing with it externally because that then it burdens everybody. And now, the pilot three showed certain risks and we are aware of them. Number one is availability of experts in different regions. Even though in the last 13 years, we implemented different forms of support in our educational system by means of various operation operating programs uh, of education for uh, competitiveness, research and development. Now we have the operating program called Jan Amos Komensky. Can you guess how many billion crowns were poured into the education system in those years? Do you think that it's single billions or tens of billions? How many tens of billions? It's 104 billions of crowns. It should be seen somewhere. It must be seen somewhere. Yes, sure, there were results. We cannot say that it's invisible. Yes, there were things that changed, but not uh, to such an extent that we could call it a systematic change. No, no data would indicate that there is a systematic change. Data show us certain schools. They showed that there are bigger gaps between different schools because the programs allowed schools to participate actively. And those that did not know about the program or uh, did not want to participate, they stayed behind. So we unfortunately did not build the capacities for this incre incredible amount of sum. We produced the Czech education in maps. We can see how colorful the Czech Republic is, how dramatic differences can be seen in different regions and schools and forms of tra training and teaching. Then cooperation with the founder of the school. Founders change which means that people who present the founding organization change and these different people see the, the schools differently. And when the school receives the support, some of the founders conclude that it's a, it's a poor school. No, that, that's an opportunity. Then the voluntary approach carries a certain risk. Schools can refuse that. Even though we are convinced that this school really needs support, we cannot force them. And monitoring, which means it's more or less our internal thing to be able to evaluate the impact, not only how it really reflected, but how, what the quality was, the, because the expert capacities are limited. Here I can want to show how our roles are divided in the level of support. This is what we do, then the National Pedagogical Institute, which, which prepares and coordinates the package of the support that we implement later on uh, in personnel and content. Then we communicate with schools once in four months with principals, 
how they see it, uh, how it works. And we also try to build a certain bi-directional link to build the trust that we do care about the quality of education. And obviously, last but not least, there is this point of evaluation of the financial support. This is our point of view. Currently, we are supporting 65, 65 schools in this pilot project in various regions. This is our evaluation of the um, approach or attitude of the headmasters and you, in the pilot. And you can see that from our perspective, it's a very positive um, reaction of those headmasters who initially didn't want to go anywhere and didn't want to participate in anything. And by participating, they did um, find out that it didn't make sense for, for them to join and to be involved. What uh, the experience shows us so far, it seems that um, the goal is being fulfilled. Uh, we still have a long road ahead of us because the participation of the various schools from various regions is not um, equal because even the size of the inspection authorities was set up depending on the number of schools in the various regions um, and we should rather set it up according to the conditions in which they work because there are regions in the country which certainly do need a higher uh, intensity of support um, in let's say slightly underprivileged regions compared to others. The schools do know in any case what they can use, what support is on offer, where they can turn to and how they can develop further when that directed support is coming to an end in their in their school so it's differentiated individualist individual support tailored to the needs of that specific school even if we write a new framework educational program or some other strategy it'll never be a document that will go straight through into the schools if they are not set and if the headmas if the schools are not set to receive them and if the headmasters do not believe in them. Thank you. We would like to thank the um, Central School Inspector Tomar Zatlokal by introduce, for introducing the new support system of the inspection and we would like to invite the next speaker Lenka Burganová who is the head of the regional branch of the National Pedagogical Institute in Ústí nad Labem, which is way far out in the northwest. And I would also ask, like to ask Ivo Yupa to come and join us up here. And let's speak about this now. Lenka, I would like to start with you. because you've been there from the beginning with Pilot 3. You are responsible for the pro pilot programs. So what is your experience of, you know, from the point of view of a person who's been pulling it in one region? What were the challenges? What did you encounter and how are things moving forward? Before the um, conference was opened, a colleague from Prague asked me, well, what are you going to say? And before I managed to answer, he said, the truth, right? Because those of you from the tough north are always forgiven for saying the truth in the rough region. So I've been working there for four years and you're probably interested in the process and challenges and the positive sides of the support. From my perspective, information number one, most headmasters freak out. They think that when we address them in cooperation with the Czech school inspection, although we try to do it very nicely and kindly, they start thinking whether they are really as catastrophic 
that they have to join Pilot 14, whether it means that we are going to tell on them to their supervising authority and they will get some sanctions. During the first meeting, during the first address, they hardly ever perceive it as an opportunity, an opportunity to improve in criteria number two, pedagogical management or leadership. The second point, when we introduce the pilot, they are quite surprised that we will focus on them, the school management. We usually invite not just the headmasters, but also the broader management so they can bring their deputies and we ask them to do so or other teachers if they consider them part of the management. And if when they find out that we are not going to focus on PH Max or reconstruction the gym, that we're not going to um, complain about the system or the Ministry of Education, but we would rather focus or like to focus on how they manage to lead their teachers. It's quite a painful reflection for them because they have so little time for these activities, as they themselves say. They hardly ever have a chance to look at things from the outside in order to evaluate on in what way me as a headmaster am I leading my teachers. So those are the two most significant pieces of information. In what way do you manage to work with those headmasters later on? When I introduced this project um, at one forum um, in cooperation with the inspection, the first question was, how much money did you get for this? And I said, well, no, no money. And everyone laughed at me. But nonetheless, it's still happening. Well, money is a significant part of the support, but we are trying to find it and the school has to find try to find it wherever they can so some activities are funded from the national renewal uh, precisely the support of equal opportunities another option is that the school is helped by um, drawing on the uh, template program and the third possibility is the school's own money. During the whole time of this program, it has never happened that the cooperation would be terminated because of the lack of money. I'm interested to find out uh, what is it what is it in for or what, what is the NPI in for? What do they get out of it by being involved in this project? Um, well, I wouldn't look for anything super unusual or I'm not going to say something unexpected, you know, for everyone to go like, oh, that's what. Well, the Czech school inspector mentioned that we learned to go to schools that need it and we've learned to address them and offer some tailor-made support that for those who are not quite typical applicants for our support would actually bring something good. Um, we don't have any extra money to do this or to bring into the scheme. But what I'd like to mention there are various operational programs which had 100 billion 100 billion crowns there are so many different programs which bring money into schools they get money from the national renewal uh, program etc so we don't have any other extra money for this it may, that may be limiting but on the other hand uh, it might be an opportunity um, 
by building up the capacity, by educating these people, and by coordinating the system in some way. We are learning to work in a way that wasn't there at the beginning. We didn't carry this out. And from the figures that you've seen, it's clear that it's not completely bad that the schools reflect on this um, offer. We've introduced a sort of a service that is very useful and that the clients appreciate it. And that is something that has already been mentioned here. I'm just sort of repeating it basically. But that's it. That's the thing. And um, I wouldn't really, really want to expect anything else because even this is more than I've expected. What is the vision for NPI? How should it work together with uh, the inspection? We should be focusing on this support activity primarily because we have just a few people in our regional um, branches, usually three to four people, who are there as key employees. But then there are many other different people from various projects who are there sort of working ad hoc, temporarily. Some of the projects last three to five years, some of them six years, which is not a completely sh short time. And the regional branches would then have 10 to 15 people, depending on the various schools that are involved in the National Renewal Plan um, program or another program that supports equal opportunities or digitization, which means that some branches putting these two pro programs together, even if it's half-time, part-time jobs, there would be up to 10 people working there. And then what they're doing is basically consultation and um, advice. They do not go into those schools and tell the teachers or, or the headmaster what to do or help them with things, but they help them to connect them with various other actors, help them to draft various development programs. One example would be that in the previous period, Lenka actually connected schools with an activity of various NGOs or various foundations that intervene in areas that the schools need, which meant that at a point where neither the uh, regional educational institution uh, or some other didn't offer anything that was actually necessary, the city said, well, there are these things that we need and that they need and let's find someone who can support them. So we are, don't have the ambition to um, basically steal the, the education market and have the largest portion of the pie. That would be a useless ambition. I think that even the regional educational institute, like here in the South Moravian region, is not um, here for that purpose. Consultation for schools and networking various players and offering the products, the support products are, are key tasks, I think. And as director, <laughs> I shouldn't really care, and it is, I really don't care, whether the service that is needed by the school is provided by us or if we don't have the capacity or if we don't know it or if we don't if we can't do it then if someone else does it um, the main thing is that the school does get the service and the support that it needs and then and we and we can we have a chance to accompany the schools while they're doing so for that reason we also have this project of equal opportunities and programs like that are conceptual changes uh, and showing how the regional offices operate. It's not they will operate as part of the project because the word sort of ev evokes this idea, but it's just a type of working that we would like these central offices working. And we are aware of the fact that in certain times we are going to support individual people by paying them, uh, perhaps from different uh, money boxes, whether it's operating programs, uh, the national plan of support, or whether it's subsidies of the ministry or whatever. So it doesn't matter. 
if you come to a school and offer them something, the school is not really interested whether money comes from that source or that source, whether it's round money or square money or triangle money. Uh, or that's our role to put it in a package that's usable for them. Thank you very much. Uh, please get ready your questions and I'm going to use the situation because from the, my point of view, this is yet another aspect of what we call the education village. Going from the logic of competitors to the logic of sharing. Uh, we've already heard it several times. We will hear it uh, 10 more times because we heard it twice only. So it doesn't matter who offers the service. The important thing is that the service is offered. And the purpose of the educational village is that the actors know where they are good. And, <clears throat> and if my colleague from the regional office is good at this, the point is not that I try to be better than him, but I can real say, well, we've got them. Uh, they can uh, support us and how can I support them, let's say from abroad, so that they can even better and how I can benefit. So no competition, but sharing. If I may add, I realized how I myself went for the stereotypical approach. Uh, this national plan of support, uh, sorry, re reconstruction or renewal, we trained super teachers or teacher trainers who had a high level of skills and education and, and to be able to train others how it really is. Not that they would say, well, I believe that it might be like this. So this was important. We trained several dozens of them and then colleagues from the project came uh, and said, imagine what's happening. Our t teacher trainers that we trained and we are ready to pay and to organize their programs at schools, they go to other educational institutions where they get more money than we are able to pay them based on the limit that we have. And this way, we cannot do it for the schools. So the first signal was like, bloody hell, what are we going to do with this? And if you get angry like that and follow the beaten track, then it's bad. And then I realized that one of my teachers told me that the difference between the rut or <laughs> beaten track and the grave is just in the depth. So I realized this is not the right way. Does that mean that we trained the trainers and said that this is what we want you to tell the schools? And now they travel around the schools they do share what we wanted them to share. It's just the fact that we no longer can pay them and we don't have to organize it. No. So it doesn't cost us anything and it's happening exactly what we wanted to happen. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. So I don't have to get angry. We, we got on an even higher level. This is what we originally should have wanted. But it just didn't come to our mind. So for that reason, we thought that the teachers would, that the trainers would train on our behalf. And if they do it on someone else's behalf, now it, it sounds just stupid or, uh, but I have to admit that my first reaction was not positive. And even now many of us say things like that, but don't feel them or don't act like that. Before I encourage people to ask questions, I'd like to ask the central inspector you mentioned your analysis, the same regions, the North Bohemian difficult region and so on. And now the Kernoff region, which is becoming a hit because they did improve the, some of the aspects without improving the conditions. So, so if the Pilot 14 is running and you pour a lot of money in it, you manage to uh, educate trainers who then become active in that. So when can we expect positive outcome? Is it in decades or do you have any ambition? 
So how to practice that? Or will we sh say after 20 years uh, it's the same, so we stop doing it? I can't tell you an accurate number because different regions will have different reactions. Some regions will be really slow and others can be faster. The most difficult thing is to believe those things that we do. And it's very hard to measure because if we do something for the fact that because the Czech uh, inspectorate goes there, then the pedagogical institute goes there and tells them to do something and we do it only for the fact that we are supposed to be there, then everybody leaves and we'll, and the schools will continue working the, the old way. We are victims of the stereotype, stereotypes and they frequently win because the communication uh, is not exactly rich, even though our outcomes we could see some communication, but we don't believe in the homogeneity of the classes. We believe that, that the best thing is that the children should be sort of similar and then the education is easier if the children are alike. We believe that if we organize a class uh, in a school focusing on something and we prepare teachers that can teach uh, specialized classes like sports, languages, maths or so on. Or we believe that if we divide pupils into smaller groups that this is the recipe how to make achieve better results but none of those work. We are the only country in Europe who still believe these old things and for that might be the reason that countries that used to be behind us like Estonia, Poland or most of most of our neighbors they are now better than us because to educate children that the school adopts to it's much more demanding for teachers. It, there are several approaches different supports, development of competencies, self-esteem building. But if the teachers don't believe that, we can organize as many pilots as we want to and the result will be zero. So we can see certain change in schools that got convinced that if we do it differently, then now it will have a positive effect or benefit for the teachers and for us as schools and we can enjoy our work and then it, it's reflected in the educational results of the pupils. So we are trying to build and communicate mainly with principals because we cannot do anything with the, without the principals. So through principals and the teachers teams try to build the trust that it makes sense to change certain things and if we succeed then we will see the impact relatively quickly. In 2006 when Germany ended up in a, in a catastrophic results they spent a year debating how the PISA had bad measuring criteria but then they decided to do something and in the following cycle which came up five years later, they experienced a certain improvement. Another five years they got into the group of the above average results or countries that have more than average results. So we have examples from other countries that it is feasible and we might get inspiration from that. I hope that we'll manage to persuade the schools themselves that it's worthwhile. So. If you have a quest if you have questions please ask them now otherwise we are going to go for lunch I'd like to ask if uh, reduction of administrative tasks for principals was there any proposal like that as part of your because principals don't have time because they are flooded with all kinds of paperwork and questionnaires and forms to fill in and so on could this be one of the supportive measures that would help us tremendously if we speak with principals and they tell us how much they have to do the paperwork it's it's insane that's one thing and second thing is rather methodological. I like the diagrams how the principals are happy with your activities. Isn't that strange that an organization that inspects them is supposed to support and then it evaluates its own activities. That's crazy, isn't it? You came as our bosses uh, 
uh, how we are doing and ask us, uh, how do you like us? We are your inspectors. How you do you like us? Isn't that crazy? Uh, I would expect evaluation to be done externally, not by you. Your, if the schools know that you will visit them uh, again in one year and ask you, ask them how they like you. No, we do not evaluate it ourselves. I hope that it was clear from my presentation that we don't evaluate the impact of our activities ourselves. That wouldn't be logical. So that's something we don't do it. We did it together in those three pilot regions, but it's individual schools, just single schools. So we take it just ran, uh, just as an indicator. We just are interested that it's not uh, on the other end of the range. And we haven't inspected schools for the 10 years now. That's not that inspection. Inspection is one of four things that we have competed competencies, evaluation of conditions and results and quality and effective efficiency. Uh, making an inspection, uh, we cannot evaluate anything. We can check the document exists, it's signed and it's dated, but we don't learn anything from the document about the quality of education. So for that reason, we are probably the only inspectorate that is the concept uh, competence to evaluate, which is something completely different than to inspect or check. Yes, checking is something that if the school fails in something, it's caused by, by something else, that it's got a uh, cause, and then we can go there and see what the reason is, but there might be uh, minor weaknesses, former weaknesses, but these do not influence the quality of the process. That's why we focus on the quality of the process. And if we know the quality of the process, when we are able to help the schools to go forward and eliminate, eliminate the weaknesses. So this is the philosophy of our approach. Otherwise, the evaluation of the feedback will happen also after this year's pilot, because this now includes dozens of schools and we will see how the regions will respond and what will be really needed as we have very few experts and we, now we have a chance because we have the same regional structure and organization will be able to be transferred the expert capacities between regions which may help the schools. In the next part, we are going to have representatives of the Ministry of Education. Since 2013, we've been really asking for an information system. We do know that 90% uh, schools uh, have an internal system, including kindergarten. We are actually the most digitized part of the um, national administration. On the other hand, however, we share so little information. Uh, we have information about pupils, teachers, economy, but the sharing is the most difficult. Um, and that's why we are being asked to share information all the time. In Denmark in 2018, the Danish Ministry of Education created uh, an educational information system for all schools that all schools have to use which we imagine the if we imagine this if there's a legislational change it is all reflected immediately in the information system so that the headmasters don't have to do anything they don't have to verify anything i'm going for a skiing trip i have to have an agreement with a tutor with a doctor i don't have to call anyone it's templates i just add the name and and the problem is solved so there are all sorts of accompanying issues that facilitate the the activity of the schools so far we didn't manage to um put it in place here although it was already contained in two strategies the strategy for 2020 and 2030 plus so we'll see if we manage Unless there is another issue that would prevent you from enjoying your lunch and that you nef definitely want to ask about, um, I would actually like to announce lunch. 
Um, after lunch, we have a short film to see, very short and intense, and then a meeting with two very precious special ladies. Before that, Marqueta is going to tell us what is going to take place in other rooms. The Moravian premiere of a document called The Journey that we uh, put together with uh, NPI. And then there'll be a purely ladies panel. Um, I've been asked to point out various workshops that will be taking place in the same building in, on different floors. You can see what they are like or wh what topics do they cover outside on the tables. You don't have to be there the whole time. You can just sort of peek in and go out, listen to, listen for an answer and leave. Use this potential even during the lunch break and they will be running throughout the afternoon until 4 p.m. And that is it. that's it for the organizational information and see you later at one o'clock. It's great to have such, a, such an accurate or on-time audience. Uh, many people have probably gone for workshops and it's good that we have people who really want to be here because we, have, we are going to have a great opportunity to have a Moravian premiere of the document, film documentary, stories of three schools, three regions. It's called The Journey and it's a presentation of how we managed to uh, incorporate pupils that came as a result of the war in the Ukraine. So, because since February 22, around 50,000 pupils from the Ukraine came here who were facing a new situation the same way as many of our teachers and principals had to face. Those, such a great number of pupils that didn't speak the language, there was something completely new. So then we'll have Hanka Smolova, Zazvorova and our colleagues from Poland and Ukraine and we'll, and we'll go. So let's start the movie. So enjoy it. Válečný konflikt na Ukrajině vyhnal z této země miliony lidí. České základní školy přijaly celkem přes 50 tisíc dětí. I my tože vám chcem poděkovat. Poděkovat za to, že vy nás tak oberigajete. Pozvali jsme se s kamerou do tří škol. We, we went to different schools and asked pupils, students and principals how they manage the situation. The Ukrainian children ended up in a strange environment. This is the first time I went to a swimming pool at school. They had to learn the first Czech words. I did not understand the word ovoce because ovoce means vegetables while it means fruits in your country. They had to learn on the go. We had serious operational problems how to adopt such a large group with different uh, needs for education. The adaptation period doesn't happen only in the classrooms but outside the school, during the, in the clubs, outings and so on. I, I believe that your tactics was great, so now it's only discipline to achieve the goal. And the informal education, this is the core of this movie. outing. September 22 in Rožnov. We are in the town of Rožnov, pod Radhoště, where there is an open-air museum. And we arrived with a selection of children from our Ostrava school, who's often sick on the bus. 
We have 40 pupils with us, and a large number of them are Ukrainian pupils. And one third of them, one third of participants are Czech pupils. <clears throat> Our school organized this event to help the pupils with integration to get used to the fact that they have foreigners next to themselves because very unusual for us as Czechs. What, what the historical people grew here and what they wore, I would say that we've got an open and wise management at the school. They are not afraid, they are courageous. And thanks to that, our school from the beginning of March had a large group of Ukrainian children. I'm Max, I'm from the Ukraine. I studied the fourth class. We didn't have modeling or ceramics as a class or a club. I arrived in March and after a few weeks I joined the class. I ended up in the Czech class and that's where I met Dominic. I, I sat in a bench behind him and he said hi. And that's how we met. Do you remember the moment? Yeah. How did you know the Ukrainian hello? Because our teachers told us how to say it and and I tried a few words through a Google Translator. The big difference is that in March 22, we created two Ukrainian classes at our school with and four Ukrainian teachers cared for them because the Czech teachers were not that busy with the Ukrainian pupils. Now we need to integrate uh, the Ukrainian children in the Czech classes. And those who have gone through the preparation phase are doing well with the Czech language. What makes the situation complicated is that we have new pupils. Some of them arrived a few weeks ago, so have, they have zero Czech. So it's going to be a challenge for them. And we are slightly worried about how to, how to put them together. When we are planning this outing, it would, I thought that it would be fine if the children could experience an attractive way how to overcome the barrier. So I thought about the game that I use in my English and German classes and the game is called Find Someone. So your task is to find a name for each, basically to find someone who meets the criterion, let's say who lived close to the sea, because I know that some of the children are from Mariupol teachers are going to participate and the Ukrainian teachers as well. Have you been to a children camp? I think it was entertaining also for the teachers because we could also learn something about each other. Are you a single child? Do you play violin? <laughs> no. Children like the game and overcame the initial shyness and they were able to communicate and to find the person that they needed to find. Class teacher. This year we brought 27 children. Some of them attended our school previously and 12 are completely new. It's children from other schools, which means Czech schools from the Karolvy Vary region. When I came to the school at Libushina, I was afraid, but we have also number of foreigners and that's why we organize the adaptation courses. We hope that the children will get to uh, meet each other and establish future relations and they will also learn to know their class teacher. We've got 10 foreigners. I speak Czech on them because they already speak some Czech and sometimes my friend helps me and she speaks Ukrainian. pupils from our sixth class are actually all newcomers who came in March or April. So they already had a previous contact with Czech. They were 
put in a special class led by a Ukrainian teacher. They had intensive Czech classes, but together did, they didn't get it in touch with the Czech children. The atmosphere is very friendly. They like us as their friends. My person is with Samira and Lisa. They are actually completely like children back at home. That's why we found it reasonable to incorporate them as early as at the beginning of the school year. We always organize adaptation courses in September, and that's how we try to start them uh, so that they can get to know each other and become friends, especially among children who did not know each other previously. I would say a great team. Sports. November 22. So we are really on the grounds of the elementary school in Khomutov. It's the oldest school in Khomutov. This part was built as early as the Emperor Franz Josef in 1893. Since that time, it's always worked as a school. I'm really thankful for this project of sport classes of the clubs as football, basketball, or, uh, wrestling, uh, those children have five hours of physical training, which means three extra compared to normal. And these classes are great. Sports, that's adrenaline, relaxed, fun, playing with ball, activities, running, uh, endurance, dancing do you dance team game i don't enjoy sports the ukrainian children that joined our school uh, they learned about the possibilities of sporting activities quite early on when it comes to the ukrainian children they integrated very well in the sports point of view as i can judge they are really achievers they want they want to move and for that reason they uh, they find it easier to become a part of the team before the invasion of russians in the ukraine when there were children that somehow did some sports or had some other hobbies it was always easier with those children who were active sports or hobbies school in Ostrava. For the new school year, uh, we are entering it with uh, new experience that we gained since spring 2022. And this experience enriched us. And as we know what to expect, we are slightly more worried. It's not just like, let's go for it. Everything will go smoothly. I personally, I'm a class teacher of the sixth grade. I've got 26 children with different educational needs, two boys from the Ukraine. But luckily, these have been with us since March. So they have basic knowledge of Czech. They know how things work at, in Czech schools. The communication is easy with them. But me as a Czech teacher, it's a challenge for me how to work with these two boys in the Czech classes because to teach Czech to Czech pupils and Czech to foreigners that's completely two different subjects and I'm expected to d manage both approaches within the same class and I'm worried about that. Katarina in the Ukraine they we pronounce the normal rolling R and in Czech you say Katarina that's, that's a nightmare for the Ukrainians. And now you have two Catherines as your friends. But I call them Katka, 
Katka 1 and Katka 2. <laughs> On one hand, I know that it's impossible, and uh, actually it is possible that, that the children's brains work like sponges, absorb a lot. And even children that come with zero knowledge of the language, they can finish the fourth class like my son in Germany when he graduated in a German class. He was the best in German, better than the uh, native German. So it is possible. Sometimes we don't understand as adults when we try to learn foreign languages. I always say that they have superpower, an extraordinary ability to learn foreign languages until a certain age. So uh, I'm not so worried about them. They will manage. These two are Catherine's. They are 14. They love yellow as their color. She likes a cat as her favorite pet. And the other one, a dog. She's got a younger brother. He's 11 and he attends the General Pika school. And the other Catherine does not have any siblings. Their parents, our mother is The names are difficult, aren't they? Her mother is Bohumila, and father is Karel. Her mother is Andrea, and the father is Thomas. They liked this trip or outing because they didn't have to stay at school and learn. And the same is true of me. I also love it when I don't have to study. We mostly wanted for every child to experience some sort of success and we hope that we haven't missed any student or pupil. We support children to realize in a playful form what are the basics of human contact which happens even without the knowledge of Czech. The activities that we included with the children at the adaptation course uh, are include a movement activity called ships. You are ships and the ships symbolically start attending the second level of primary school. I really enjoyed the game called the ships where we had to stand on chairs and we had to get to the other side we couldn't fall from the chairs and we couldn't even speak either if someone falls down the whole ship goes back to the beginning we forgot to say that so they've got quite a tough job because they have to come up with a strategy they have to agree on something but the most important point of the whole activity, of course, is mutual cooperation. It's true that communicating or the communication was quite tough at the beginning. The children were angry at one point, perhaps also disappointment. They were perhaps extremely sorry that it can't happen or can't succeed. But they had a few people who inspired others by various points that others could mimic. And they basically gave advice to others and the others could imitate. We helped each other a lot on those chairs and it was really great. They succeeded in moving all 26 children to the other side of the room. No one gave up. I think we played this game to get to know each other and their applause and joy that they felt at the end that you could see and hear was really, really beautiful for a class teacher.
Okay, run around, run around. Go around. You have to go ahead. You have to go forward. Move it, move it, move it. My name is Yuri Matisek. I'm a coach of um, free fighting or Roman fighting. At the same time, I'm also one of the external um, gym class teachers. We are in the sports hall for fighting in Khomutov. We cooperate with uh, clubs from other neighboring towns. What I like the most about fighting is pulling someone down like this. There's a new wave of children who've arrived just recently, so it's more interesting for us and for them. They've just arrived from Ukraine. What I know from children from the school, from the sports class, is that they were divided. There were four new pupils from Ukraine, two communicated. They felt uh, they just got into the team immediately and two didn't want. They sat down at the back and I told them, well, you don't, you never know what they went through. So don't ask them, don't push them. You don't want to evoke anything unpleasant. It's definitely a contribution for the club with the arrival of these children because in Eastern Europe this type of sport is much more serious and if the coach says that there is a practice weekend or a tournament the kids are always there. The Czech Ice Hockey Association addressed various clubs with having Ukraine hockey players in Ukraine and they would need to bring them in. So we welcomed some hockey players and thanks to Mr. Sokhor, who's the vice chairman, we arranged accommodation for them. We included them in training and we basically involved them. They didn't have anything no equipment, nothing. They basically just came with a plastic barrack, one backpack, one backpack. Some came just in their high heel shoes directly from hiding in the metro. Some had complete equipment. They came to the stadium. We gave them some equipment. The boys went just little. Some of them were older. We asked the parents of our kids and there was a collection. So now we'll divide into two groups and we're going to practice in different stations. They wanted to go train immediately. They really came from there and the sport was really important for them and probably for the parents as well. They wanted them to integrate right away and also try to forget or become part of the new world, so to speak, the new society where things work. That might have been the reason why they really wanted and you could tell from the boys they have completely different thoughts you could see that they haven't been on the ice for a while for a long time but they they laughed in the cabin and with the other boys and the parents were really grateful that we helped them that way and they're still grateful not just they were but they're still some of them have moved on not all of them actually remained here my name is Ina and my son Roman is here. We've arrived to the Czech Republic so that he could work uh, on his training. He's been playing hockey for six years and I really want to thank the Czech Republic and everyone who helped us here. My son found many friends already and that's the best thing for us. They're used to fight at every training, which is not quite usual here. I don't know if it's because of the war that's there, that they came here, they're so grateful, they want to play, they want to be involved all the time, or it's part of their character, or they've been brought up that way. But that you can tell that it's there compared to our children. 
they're really more into the fighting. Um, they're used to it. They used to fight a bit more and find their place, uh, even in sports. Our adaptation course is concluded. We have to go home. I'm really sorry that we have to go home because I would have liked to have been there longer. It was absolutely great. I think I found friends here, not only Ukrainians, but also Czechs. Our school welcomed many children who brought many different stories with them. We have gradually gotten to know them and we understood that there is no difference between children. Children like to play, they have similar worries even if they are from a different environment. I really like the games because they brought it together. The adaptation course is very meaningful even for the class teacher because the class teacher can tell to whom they can turn to, who has an ability to lead the class, who has an ability to support the class. And that's um, a meaning for me that I will see the whole ship um, in the ninth grade at the end of the journey ahead of the entrance exams of secondary school. So this is Dimitri Dikomin. He's 14 and he's been here in the Czech Republic for seven months. His favorite color is black and he likes cats. His favorite Czech food is Segerin goulash with a dumpling and he also likes black currant uh, Swedes, his name's mum, his mum's name is Olha and dad's Alexander and he also has an older sister, Polina. Sport has always been part of my life. I also, that's why I also studied uh, PE and I've been teaching PE from all of my life. I wanted to become also my pupils part of life. Anything, I think it's even included in some documents of our school and we want us we want to be teachers that the pupils will be happy to meet i was a nautic child and it's been recommended for me to do some sort of sport and since i'm from ostrava it was a period of vigislav macha where fighting was really at top level we had an olympic hero um and therefore it was clear that i would go for fighting i've been in national representation, I've traveled the world and now I see the same thing with the kids. There are children and they ask, is he naughty? And I said, yeah, he's naughty, yeah, he's, he's in the right place and I can deal with him, I'm the coach. We'll be movie stars now. Yeah, I want you to be stars on the ice, mostly. Isn't it terrible to get up so early? It's better to start the day with something you enjoy rather than with school. Of course, you find someone who doesn't like you and you find kids who do like you, but you find a lot of experience, a lot of friends, and you remember it for all your life. And even if you don't make a living through hockey, it's really about finding a company of nice people. A fresh experience from the lookout tower where the lady was selling tickets and she was asking what sort of tickets they are and she asked whether they want to learn Czech and I said some do, some say they don't want because they don't want to cooperate and she said well send them back well you can't I told her some of those kids are from Kharkiv or Mariupol they really lost everything and especially the small children they, uh, they can't even same they can't even say why they don't want to and I have to try to understand and I think the children need the understanding the most. The journey, whether we run from something or we are trying to help the running, we are always on a journey. We want to thank to all participants for their energy and the whole Czech education system. We keep our fingers crossed.
and special greetings and a lot of strength in difficult moments to Carlo Vivari on behalf of Nelly. What was difficult, Spitki, that's a terrible word in Czech. So let's do it again. Uh, I forgot to turn the camera on, so do it again. <laughs> We should probably have a free, quiet moment now to to absorb uh, the strength of the movie. So we felt the same during the Bohemian premiere in Prague. Now we met two of the children in person during the premiere. There was the boy between those two Katharinas and one of the blonde girls who speaks such a perfect Czech that I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And that's amazing when the children on the screen look like in reality, authentic, live. It was full of strong moments when Dimitri said that he didn't play the violin. Then at the end, he played the violin. He was just making fun of that because he used to play in an orchestra so we gave him an, them, him an opportunity to share his art and he was excited to be able to do that. The same way as Nastya, when I asked her what she would like to learn in the next school year, she said she would love to find new friends and it was a strong moment. It shows how human these and also authentic these needs are across the cultures. So it was a strong experience. Uh, we had those teachers there, it was all in a festive mode. So if you are interested in more, we opened the movie, uh, it's freely available. If you want to use it for your work, you can. And together with Mr. Hrushka from NPI, we prepared this textbook and you can take this textbook up and leaving and there are interviews with the authors and ideas for other activities and also a list of things that NPI can do for you. So much. We'll go back to children movie stars. I promise that you will meet more of them. And now I want to ask Halka. She's from NPI, which is the National Pedagogic Institute. And she's the author of a great text and since 19, 2019 she's a guarantor of for programs that work with foreign pupils or students and she will show us a presentation how NPI supports pupils of different languages. Thank you. And we have to say goodbye to Martin Kriš, who needs to go back to Bratislava. Thank you for coming and we'll stay in touch. I thank you for this opportunity and I got this pleasant duty to present part of the work of NPI, which is based on support of children of different languages. So I'm Halka Smolova Zavorova and I represent many other colleagues who deal with this topic in within NPI. I've got 13 coordinators, regional coordinators who support me. Some of them are here. So that's people who do a great job in the regions. I'll speak about that later on. I'm a little bit nervous uh, to seeing them here, so that's why I'm mentioning their names, that I appreciate what they do and that they came to see us. 
Let me start by introducing the services that the National Pedagogic Institute provides to teachers who teach uh, foreign pupils. I divided this into the four pillars of support just for myself so that you can have a nice culture of view. I added this picture of different pillars or columns from the Museum of Music in Barcelona. And on my own behalf, what's important is that similarly to the columns, our services are colorful. We provide loads of different services depending on what the needs are among students, teachers or parents. That's why we have different shapes, different colors. Because our services are not one service for all, but we always try to respond to what our colleagues need, what sort of need or su uh, support we should provide. And what's important that our colleagues from schools have to know that there is someone who will help them if they uh, cannot do something just on their own and we can be on their side and support them. So that's why I want to show what sort of things we do. These four pillars can be divided into the support of further education and mediation of methodological materials, production or development of methodological materials and supportive materials for working with parents or dealing with parents. So that's number one. Number two is the services of adaptation coordinators, which is a financial support. It's a thing that goes directly to schools. Financial support of someone who deals or spends time with children of different languages. Then interpreters and translators and services of that, they are for free so that at least this is not a burden for the teachers. And then the website called cizinci.npi.cz. And this website contains all the information that we hold and is available. So we as coordinators will be happy to guide you through this website. Because if you uh, get there without knowing this website, they say, wow, it's wonderful how much it contains and how much I could use from the website. So that's why I'm presenting the website as well, just in case you don't know about it. This is the first pillar, the nationwide support and network of regional coordinators. And this takes me to my colleagues who work in the regions and they support teachers and schools, network them. A very important activity includes also the contacts, help, mediation, because many there are many things that one person don't, doesn't know how to deal with it, but there are other colleagues who are experienced in that. So this is also the task to direct people to colleagues who are already experienced in one or another area, especially in the area of foreign pupils. What I find really important is that nearly all regions have a network of co-workers and everything is informal. Frequently my colleagues say, and I'm proud of them, I can say that they have personal links to NGOs, to regional offices and so on. So they are able to help and advise, provide contacts and link parents with teachers and anybody who might need help. So this is work of the regional coordinators. And at the same time, they also provide uh, adaptation and coordination services and interpreting. I also want to mention that we have new video materials, methodological materials uh, for teaching Czech as a foreign language. There is also a seminar organized by Radim Oshmera, my colleague, who's also the author of those 22 video programs. And that's just short video clips 
showing how Czech can be taught as a foreign language, how to start, what methods to use. So if you want to consult anything, Radim is available in Office 209. He works with authentic materials and he's a great colleague of mine and teacher of Czech as a foreign language. So these are the videos. There are various materials that can be found on the website czinci.npi.cz. So I can mention that last year, after the invasion to the Ukraine, we cooperate, cooperated with the Czech TV and we created 26 methodological and worksheets to animated videos of the Czech TV and these can be used with foreign children. There are many more things that I could mention. Perhaps I should mm, point out webinars because as the time was difficult, what taught us that an uh, online webinar is not a bad tool at all, how to provide information to colleagues within the region. And when I joined the position of the methodologist, I said to myself that information would be to get the information as far as the town Ash, which is the most western town in the Czech Republic. So in those two years, we started a lot of webinars and online support. And when I went for a holiday last year, and it was the first day of my holiday, I got an email where a teacher said, that she said she would like to ask further questions as to the material and that she had attended the webinar uh, and signed by the elementary school in Ash. So I felt like great, the goal has been achieved. It got as far as Ash. But by all this, I want to say that the online support and the webinars helped us to contact people who would otherwise found, find it very difficult to reach a seminar, traveling two, three hours to be able to get there. So it's, so it's very important for us that they deal with their topics, even if they don't have such a great you know, slot of time. So webinars are our daily bread. I'm not saying that we don't organize seminars, but we started liking the webinars. Otherwise, these are covers of different teaching materials. Some of them are produced by NPI and we don't mind. We are, on the contrary, we are grateful that we can share all the materials produced by different NGOs. We can share experience of teachers and other things that uh, are created and there are many of those created. I've been speaking about the support of all pupils and students that are of different languages. Obviously recently uh, recently we spoke a lot about Ukrainians and I always cry when I see this movie because I am a weeper but we realize that it's not only Ukrainians, all the children who have to enter the Czech education system and come from different countries. Because when, if we realize that none of the children has opted for that, it's true that refugees are in a difficult situation, but even the children who come because the parents decided to relocate, those children, it wasn't their choice, they come to this new school, not with the same trauma like the Ukrainians, but also with perhaps negative experience and it's not that easy for them to join the educational system. I always say that imagine that you come to a class that you don't understand anybody and you are supposed to start learn, learning there. So that's the reason why it's so important to find support for all these children. Uh, let me run through that. The network of regional coordinators. I mentioned my colleagues already. And after the invasion to the Ukraine, we experienced a huge boom of requests for support and services. And if there were some people who worked really hard on that, it was the 13 coordinators in the regions who worked day and night for 
and used all their strengths and possibilities. As some of them worked part-time only, they took a holiday in order to provide the services, at least in their free time. So it was wonderful to see their devotion to that. So in that time, we provided 894 consultations paid by the ministry on the phone and in person. But all these things are just those few measurable ones. But then there were very many consultations that didn't have this official form. Simply people went to schools and helped them to, to deal with their topics. That's what our colleagues are good at. They also showed teachers what sort of materials to use, which way to go, because the teacher until the teacher has the children in the classroom, doesn't have to deal with that. Once he see or she sees the children there, then immediately they have to respond. And that's why I, we try to be really flexible in our services to provide them now. Since September, we've had a format of uh, training called We Are Teaching Foreigners. Let's get advice. Let's consult. We're trying to have the schools network with each other uh, more often than once every six months. And with the situation that we have now, we started trying to spread the support more often. Since September, every month, the regional branches have had meetings of sharing and consultation that created a learning group. Uh, for these learning groups, we also have a nationwide learning group, which is great because once every two months we meet and we consult things, we share what we've experienced, we talk a lot and at the same time we share where we live and it's really nice to m see people from all over the country meeting, it's, it's just magical. My colleagues in the regions provide adaptation services, interpreting translations. When I started putting this presentation together, I realized there was so much that I would like to tell you and show you that I really had a huge presentation and gradually I started skimming it down and what I've been left with are pictures and four bullet points. So now the services of the adaptation coordinators. That is why I have the pillows there. Because pillows are an expression of what the adaptation should mean when the child comes to the school and an adaptation coordinator um, receives them. The coordinator should enable the child to fit in and find nice, I, since I didn't find nice pillows, I asked artificial intelligence to draw me nice pillows. So these are pillows drawn by artificial intelligence. The support of adaptation coordinators means that one month they get support in the school. We pay all the financial needs the school only says for whom the support is meant for whom from the school uh, it is meant who knows the child or who's going to do it with a child who walks with the child through the school shows them what's where who does what explains to the child where to go to the bathroom where to go for lunch, what you need to ask for, what you don't, because even sometimes the social entry may be difficult. So all of these things, including the basics of Czech and how to say Dobry den, hello, and so on, because it's not the same everywhere. This is what the children can get. What's important, and I want to boast in a way, that since um, the uh, invasion in Ukraine, schools didn't know what to do. And within three months, we've spent all of our money that we've had from the Ministry of the Interior, but we were happy to spend it because this was the first pillow um, to help the schools. 
when there were no other conditions and when there was no other support lined up, um, NPI was the first sort of helper and supporter in this area. And during that time, we've allocated 465 adaptation coordinators and we supported 2,482 children, which the schools truly appreciated because they had someone else whom could support the children and they didn't have to um, use their resources. Interpreting and translations, the principle is that we need to agree on things and understanding is the most important, not just the language, but also of social habits and customs. And the interpreters help to achieve this in the schools. They're trying to explain to the schools in such a way that there are no misunderstandings because there is no bad will with the parents or with the children. There are only misunderstandings. So there are translations and interpreters for schools completely free of charge. And the service is important. They let us know that they want on this day, they want translations at one hour, two hours from this and that, that, that language. And we actually get that person, we connect them and the person goes there. They don't have to figure out how to pay it. Where will they find someone of that language and so on. We have 18 languages available. Our methodological material and website, my colleague quickly added a QR code, which means you can go to the website directly if you wish. There's so much material that it's almost getting too much, but for us, it's important that we can offer all of these things to you. You can always find them there. You don't have to store them at home, but you will always find them on this website. And if you don't find them, let us know and we'll tell you where they are because that's our library. And it's important for us to make sure that you have all the material available to you. And last but not least, a picture of one helping the other in the area of supporting children and pupils of um, foreigners. And I hope we are going to be um, allies even in the future. So that's it from my side. Thank you, Halka, for an excellent presentation and also for her great zeal in this work uh, in NPI. And now it's my honor to welcome Oksana Stupak. I'm wondering how to um, introduce her. I was uh, happy to meet her at Masaryk University. She was originally working at Masaryk University, but before that she worked in Kiev. She focuses on qualitative research in primary schools and secondary schools. She also functions in the City Institute and she was also active as an assistant in classrooms and she's also a mother of two sons with whom she had to deal with the situation. So I have great um, admiration for her and now I'd like to give her the floor for us to share what she can share with us. My name is Oksana Stupak. I'm Ukrainian. I arrived here in March last year. I've been learning Czech only for one year, so I apologize for my Czech, but I'm still learning. I'm mother of two pupils in kindergarten and fifth grade. When I arrived here, I started working at the Masaryk University Institute of Pedagogical Sciences and I had to see and learn how I could be useful and the adaptation of Ukrainian children in Czech schools is a very interesting topic for me. First of all, because I'm a mother and I will be actually following what the adaptation looks like and I can also help support my children 
in dealing with. But on the other hand, as a teacher, I wanted to understand from a scientific point of view what the school can do and what issues and problems and challenges um, are dealt with by the parents, by the children, by the schools. And so I started researching the adaptation of Ukrainian children. More than 40,000 Ukrainian um, Ukrainian pupils. We don't call, we call each other not migrants and we don't call each other ourselves refugees. We called our, call ourselves forced refugees. At one point, I never thought I would be learning Czech. I thought I would be only learning English and now I have to learn two languages at the same time. Most uh, Ukrainian pupils live in the central part of the Czech Republic. I like one phrase. One colleague from the National Pedagogical Institute said that Ukrainian children have uh, stolen lives because they never thought they would have to move somewhere. They had plans for the future. They had plans for the summer, where they would go, what they would do. And they had to change everything. And so I have to say that this situation really supported, was really supported by the Czech Republic and the Ministry of Education and NPI and teachers and all people. We can see that more Ukrainian children, most are attending um, primary schools. But on the other hand, uh, children, when children arrived in the Czech Republic, not all of them actually joined regular education. They thought they would only be here for two months and they joined the online education. And we thought the same thing, but it was very important for me to have the children not at home. They should communicate with others. They would go to school, they would be involved in sports clubs and so on. I've been also um, involved in sports gymnastics and I know that it can help adaptation as well. This is the current situation at primary schools. We can see that not all schools have Ukrainian pupils. Um, many Ukrainian pupils are located in classrooms one to five. I work with various schools who have more than 1,000. If there are three to four or five pupils, it's better than when there are 10 or 12 Ukrainian pupils on one hand. If there is one or two Ukrainian pupils, they begin to communicate with other children better, but the capacity of the schools is limited. And I have to thank the fact that, that Ukrainian pupils had the chance to start attending Czech classes. This is my research journey here. I started in May 2022. Uh, where I started my social research on social adaptation of Ukrainian children in Czech schools. I started speaking with teachers, with parents and Ukrainian children. So we, I had these focus groups in order to understand what problems, troubles and problems they were facing. Together with the Syria Institute, we started this research and in November, we began proper research and uh, in May we already had the results. Uh, Professor Shidjova and Professor Hladek uh, presented the results and they were very interesting. And in the book called The Journey, you can also see what, what the results were. We had six schools in Brno. We spoke to parents and Ukrainian children. What is their adaptation like? And our results can be divided into academic adaptation and social adaptation. In my opinion, 
social adaptation is most important. If children can speak, if they can co cooperate, if they can communicate, and certain academic adaptation is important. But first, if they started communicating, joined the teaching and understood what the teacher wants from them, then that was important. Shall I? Uh... I ha organized my own personal research on education, dual education. One third of the Ukrainian children continue with online learning. They have Ukrainian school online and they attend a Czech school. Uh, they, they never had any experience like that, neither children nor the parents, that children would attend two schools from class one. It's a great stress for both children and parents because the online education is external form. Twice a year they sit for tests in different subjects, but now every day they attend this Ukrainian school. They spend one, two, three hours a day. One girl said, said that she has to spend uh, five or six hours per day for the Ukrainian school because she wants to understand. So coming back from the Czech school, she works for the Ukrainian school. She has actually no time for herself for communicating with children. I know that not everybody would be as strong as this girl. Why do they do that? Sometimes they cannot understand Am I going back to the Ukraine with my parents later on? Do I need to stay in the Czech Republic? Because I have to say that the Ukrainian education is slightly ahead. Because when the Ukrainians came to, to the Czech schools, they realized, aha, uh -huh, many of the things are already known to us. But that would be a different topic to compare the Ukraine and Czech schools. And the Ukrainian school supported the learning in the Czech school and vice versa. So for that reason, it was so interesting for me to see the dual education. And together with my colleagues from the Charles University, we started a research of adaptation of the Ukrainian preschool children. Because the adaptation of, with different organization and kindergartens and so on. Uh, do, should the children have the Ukrainian teacher? And they understood that the, the parents can communicate with the Ukrainian teacher in the kindergarten and the children can go there as well. So we, in May, we started adaptation of Ukrainian students. We started with various interviews. This is all qualitative research. And I have to say, that their students, because of the war, came to the Czech Republic and now frequently they communicate just between themselves or among themselves. Even the children at schools, they can communicate with the Ch Czech children, but they tend to form their Ukrainian communities. So this has also an effect on their adaptation each school is different. Different schools understand the word adaptation differently. What do they have to do? Sometimes for some schools it's okay that the children can go to school and can speak with other children. Other schools try to sh present different adaptational activities to encourage children to communicate with each other outside the school. And this adaptation uh, activities are supported by the Ukrainian schools as well. Additional learning of Czech, like Halabalova school. I am not a Czech teacher or assistant, but once a week I meet Ukrainian children on the first and second level of education, which means classes one to four and five to nine. And then psychological care. I was really surprised that not all schools have a psychologist because in the Ukraine each school has a psychologist and anybody can contact a psychologist without any problem. So 
I understood that many of the Ukrainian children needed this support of a psychologist. So this is the result of our research in May. The communication of Ukrainian children. Many of them found friends among Ukrainian children. That's the blue segment. And the language barrier, definitely. As the main problem of communication among teachers, parents, and children. But after a month or two, the children said, well, we don't have a problem. I understand everything. I just need to use the language. And the academic adaptation and the social adaptation depended on the children. When the child is open and wants to communicate, they don't care about language. Once the child is closed and wants to live on his or her own, then it, he or she finds it really difficult. And on the other hand, when they hear uh, back at home from parents, we'll go home in a month, we'll go home at the end of the year, then they don't want to learn the language knowing next month we are going home to the Ukraine, so why should I learn the Czech language? And they are have been here one year and one and a half years, and it's puzzling for them. Am I going home or am I not? Uh, what is ahead of them? Should I focus on the Ukrainian education or Czech education? Social and emotional state of the Ukrainian children. That was very important f at, at the beginning of the research. What children would like to have, what problems they have. Many of them ex are experiencing conflicts, not Czechs and Ukrainians, but also conflicts between the Ukrainian children. The language barrier was also uh, part of that, that some of the Ukrainian children spoke Ukrainian and others spoke Russian, because both languages are used there. And it caused also a problem here and generated conflicts. Sometimes children feel sort of intimidated and sociometric data from our Siri research we can see that the yellow are Ukrainian pupils, while the blue is Czech pupils. The, you can see that many Ukrainian children stand on their own or communicate with other Ukrainians. And the communication um, among Czech children. The left picture, that's the first half of the year, and second picture is the second half of the school year. The situation didn't improve during the school year. And the reason is that the social adaptation is important and needs to be further developed. Results from our qualitative data. The U Ukrainian pupils are not well integrated in the social networks and the social integration does not play a role at the end of the school year. And in my own opinion, it depends very much on the age. When the children attend the kindergarten or the first few years, it's easier for them to, to adapt. They play together, but children in the eighth or ninth class find it much harder. The age plays the role and also their life experience, they feel it much harder. And sometimes the children say, I don't need to communicate v with my schoolmates because in six months we'll go to the secondary school, so sh sh why should I care about my current schoolmates? And they don't want to communicate, not everybody. And it also depends on the teacher, how much they encourage uh, the pupils to participate in different activities and in communication. What are the problems of the social adaptation of the Ukrainian children? Most children do not have friends among Czech children. Lack of knowledge in specialized classes that was at the beginning. Now it's slightly better with the, the same also the emotional level. The social adaptation still needs to improve. 
as to the steps forward. Successful adaptation means different activities, cooperation, not only teacher and children, but also the parents. All three of them are important to communicate. The communication between the teacher and parents is also important. Children can go for an outing together with parents of Czech and Ukrainian children. That would really improve the both social and academic adaptation. As to my cooperation with Halabalova School in here in Brno, when I organized my research, I understood that I needed to go forward to help the Ukrainian children. So I created a program of social emotional support of Ukrainian children in Czech schools. This program ran from December 2022 and we organized different activities every week. And I have to say, I checked the different webinars, NPI activities, and thank you all very much for all your materials. Very important and very interesting. Then I also checked different experience of Ukrainian teachers. Uh, for that reason, we created the program the way we did. And you can see it in the magazine called Socialni Pedagogica. And this is for Ukrainian children and support children of different uh, mother languages and incorporation of different pupils in normal classes. And to conclude with, I would like to say that my colleague asked me, what surprised you most in the Czech Republic? Thinking about that, not only that you drink a lot of beer here, but I was surprised by Czech people. To what extent they are open? They open their doors for families, mothers and children and grandmas and grandpas and let us into your apartments and supported us in all kinds of ways. Also the Ministry of Education and the Czech offices, but mainly people. So I want to thank you for your support on behalf of all Ukrainian mothers. Thank you very much, Oksana. Now let's go forward to Poland. Believe it or not, but there is a children movie star in the midst of us. If you remember the Oscar movie Schindler's List, shot 30 years ago in 1993, who actually happened, most of it happened in Bernianets, where we were yesterday with our festival meeting, Brno. The movie is black and white and there is only one colorful figure and that's a small girl in a black coat who goes through the walk where uh, Nazis are capturing Jews and so on. But the girl is an adult woman now and I want to welcome her here, Olivia Dabrowska Fanarek who uses her popularity that she achieved as a child to help others, helping the Ukrainian pupils and students in Poland as a volunteer. So tell us more about that. Dziękuję uh, bardzo is the only phrase that I can say in Polish. So tell us something about how you've been working in the la more than one year now. will take it off and I hope you will understand me. I'm sorry I don't speak Czech and Ukrainian, but uh, I know we have translators here, so I think we will all um, understand everything. If you don't mind, I will sit. Um, and I didn't prepare a presentation because uh, I would like to talk with you about um, more feelings, emotions uh, than um, data. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. I am very happy uh, I can share my experience with you. And second, uh, 
it was very um, it was a pleasure for me uh, to hear Oksana and uh, Halka because um, probably you don't know but I am from teacher's family my mother is a kindergarten teacher my brother is teacher in a school for kids with autism my grandmother was a teacher and his sister my uncle is a teacher and my godmother is a teacher okay so <laughs> I am uh, oh my stepdad is the teacher so I am from teacher's family and uh, I talked with them a lot uh, during last year uh, because all of them uh, have experience with Ukrainian kids, especially my mom, because uh, she care uh, of kids uh, about three years old uh, till six years old. Uh, so um, this is. To je to období, kdy děti umí komunikovat, ale s rodiči je to často problém. Takže já jsem vlastně velice hrdá na mou maminku, protože. Letos šla na kurs speaks, not fluently, but speaks. Um, so it was uh, very interesting uh, to me to uh, hear how Ukrainian kids um, can uh, live here, how Ukraine, Ukrainian kids um, are involved in Czech uh, schools, in activities. Uh, and thank you for this. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, so about me, uh, just a um, few uh, words. Uh, I am Olivia uh, Dombrowska, and uh, I am known as the girl in the red coat from Schindler's List movie. It was 30 years ago, and uh, I had have uh, I have had a lot more experience since then. Uh, but I think uh, this movie and this role. Uh, will be the most meaningful thing in my life uh, forever and i don't mind because uh, now i can uh, do something good with this um probably you don't know but uh, it wasn't always like this uh, i'm not used to uh, interviews like this meeting like this because uh, for many many years i didn't share with people that i was this girl uh, in this movie um because I was a little kid, I didn't understand it, and it was very overwhelming when people try to talk with kids about Holocaust, about uh, Second World War. Uh, in, um, in high school, I, um, I was afraid that I don't know enough about it, and I should know. I had this feeling I should know, and I didn't. Uh, so I um, didn't like to talk about it. Um, also, I watched Schindler's List first when I was 11, and that was a very bad idea, don't recommend. Uh, so, when I grown up, uh, when I was adult, um, I also had a really bad experience with journalists. Uh, I'm talking about it um, to... Um, um, a little bit, a bit background uh, because this is very important that before Ukraine, before uh, this war uh, last year, I was in the shade um, and I didn't use this image for nothing. Sometimes, sorry, interviews, but uh, like I said, I, I don't really like journalists. But um, when the war started, uh, it was uh, it was horrible. Uh, I think you all felt the same as we in Poland because you also are so close to Ukraine. And um, I had uh, some days um, with this feeling uh, that I am uh, powerless. Uh, I felt fear and after a couple of days, um, I realized that I'm not a, in the bad situation, but Ukrainians are. And um, very spontaneous, uh, I decided to ask my mother, are we going to the border? And she said, yes, of course, because then uh, after 
really few days of the war, our government didn't do nothing actually. Uh, and people, people like me, like my neighbors organized and go to the border. Uh, there were a lot, a lot of people who needed accommodation, who needed transport from the, uh, from the border to another cities in Poland because they had uh, accommodation there. And uh, every, every person with, uh, you know, two hands and uh, energy to do do this were uh, were important. So that is how it started. But how it increased? Uh, well, uh, I decided to share on my Instagram uh, everything uh, on the border, this uh, tragedy of people, uh, because I, I thought maybe I can have a little bit influence to my followers, uh, people who knows me as the girl in the red coat. And um, there were a friend from United States who uh, made an art. Girl in the red coat on the uh, black and white background. I think you all know this, uh, uh, this uh, scene from the movie. He uh, changed it and girl had blue coat on the yellow and a black background. And we decided to use it as, um, um, I don't know, word, as an image of our uh, event, of our action. And then it's actually blowed up because now a lot of people started to uh, follow me, started to asking how we can help. And, um, and that is how I first in my life and uh, I hope last, I used this image to helping. I uh, started to do a fundraiser, uh, I still, I uh, was going to um, help at border. Uh, the most, I was driver with my mother. Um, sometimes we helped uh, in this uh, accommodation point, temporary accommodation uh, at the border. And next, when this uh, needs was different, uh, we started to help in Krakow, uh, cooperating with uh, foundation from another city to find accommodation, to find medical help and uh, to um, actually do whatever was needed. Uh, and um, that is the background. And something uh, is so important for me uh, to share uh, are this feeling that um, every person, I remember every person we helped. I remember every person uh, we drove uh, to accommodation. Um, I remember all those kids. And uh, I think um, there were a lot of kids, girls and boys in many, many colors, uh, jackets, uh, coats, and every one of them could be this girl in the uh, red coat. Actually, for me, it's uh, unbelievable that this war happens in 21 century. Um, it's very similar to Second World War uh, then kids were killed, now also they suffer. Uh, so uh, that is why I tried to contact with people around the world. And um, I remember the, actually the most, I remember teenagers because, you know, adults understood. They suffered, but understood. Kids um, adults cares about kids, you know, they didn't understand, they was afraid, but adults cared. But teenagers actually were alone. Uh, of course, they had parents, sometimes, sometimes not, sometimes parents stayed at Ukraine and sent uh, teenagers to Poland. And I felt so sorry for them because, you know, teenagers are not adult. Teenagers still inside sometimes are kids and needs this care, needs this... Uh, uh, feeling safety and um, remember siblings, uh, girl and boy, they were 16, they carried uh, with them a little dog uh, that they were sent from Kyiv to the border by their leg. Uh, they didn't have a car or bus, they uh, walked um, by about six days. They were actually so tired uh, when they uh, arrived to, um, to the 
accommodation point at the border that um, the girl slept 16 hours and they were so afraid that when we first, me and my mom, arrived for them because they had accommodation uh, near Krakow, she, the girl, uh, didn't want to go. She, she, she wanted to stay in this point, even if there was a lot, a lot of people, everyone on the ground, you know, uh, the mess. She was so afraid, but her brother, um, her brother uh, was a little bit less afraid. And next day, the next day, they decide to go with us. And first um, hour in the car, they were so silent. And when I asked about dog, they started to talking, but they didn't want to talk about what happened. And that was the same thing in every, every person, every family. They didn't want to talk. Um, we had a situation with an old, old, very, very elderly lady, I think over 90 years old, uh, who remembered, uh, who was 16, when she first time uh, were forced to abandon her house many, many years ago after or during Second World War. And she had to uh, do it again. For her, that was disaster. But she actually was the most patient and calm person. Uh, I think um, for her, it wasn't, of course, uh, good and nice, but she used to it, she remembered that she can survive. Oh, she couldn't even walk. Uh, so, and now we have a lot of Ukrainian people, Ukrainian um, kids in Poland um, at schools, and I think we share um, the same problems as you here in Czech Republic. Um, those kids, don't have this safe feeling. They actually live temporarily because still want to go back. And uh, last year we talked, yeah, this war will end in two weeks, in one month. And uh, actually they even did now, some of them are here, are in Poland uh, forever. Um, okay. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk with you. Um, help one person, one kid. It's, it's, matters it um, it matters and um we shouldn't resign uh of helping of support uh when we think no i can i can't do this i can't uh, help them all because you can't uh, it's obvious so we can't help them all but every one person every one uh hand will be good and one last thing um now uh now is a marathon not a short distance uh, run like last year. It's marathon and um, I'm starting the um, new event uh, with uh, an artist from the United States uh, that we will sell his art and all money will go to the Ukraine and uh, to Polish Foundation who cares about kids. And uh, so uh, the specifics about this action will be shown on my Instagram. So if you want to find me, it's uh, just Olivia Dabrowska and you will see because in my, um, in my uh, first photo is this girl in the blue coat on the yellow background. And uh, so if I can uh, ask you to share it, uh, it would be great uh, because we prepared this uh, action since some months. And um, uh, I know now is harder to get uh, involved people, but um, I know, I know because I heard what you were talking that there is, there are still people who wanted to help. And I, I hope we can do this together. So I am also open for um, proposition of cooperation on something I want to do more. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really sorry. It's so hard to stick to the time limit. David wanted to moderate the panel discussion of um, several ladies, but it seems that we'll have to go through two short presentation and experience share from our activities, and then a break that we are going to reduce. So sorry for this change, but we hope that you understand and you can see how 
live this topic is, how important it is to focus on that, as this is not something that we would have advanced very far. We are still on the way and still learning many important things. So for that reason, thank you very much for the chance of seeing your presentation. So now, finally, David can say something as well. So thank you, Olivia, that you gave us the Polish perspective from the very border. And now, Tatiana Miskevich, let's go to classrooms. Jana worked with children who had experienced sadness and despair, and she helped them to manage this situation together with the school and the parents. So please share the most important experience that you gained. So, hello, I am Tatiana Miskevich, and I work in the school as a Ukrainian uh, pedagogic assistant and from the second half of the school year uh, for a girl with a different Bandar language. I know that you must be tired by now, so I'll try to be really short, I promise. So in my presentation, I want to start with a text accompanying a picture. Our pupil, a Ukrainian girl from the first class, I painted a Czech flag and sign because Czech Republic is my new friend and home. People accepted us here. I have friends here. Everybody's nice to me. And Sofia painted this picture for a charity event. And I want to thank NPI and all the pedagogical workers within the Czech Republic for unbelievable help to the Ukrainian children. So we've got 35 Ukrainian pupils at school being taken care of by three Ukrainian assistants plus me, which is four, but uh, now I work on a different position. According to my opinion, the most important thing is the cooperation between the school, the children and parents. I know that a teacher assistant is trained to make sure that the communication and cooperation works as well as possible. So apart from organizational issues, the first task was to establish the best possible contact between the children and parents or with children and parents and to learn as much as possible about where they come from, whether they experienced a loss in the family because of the war, where they live in the Czech Republic, basically, personal story or information and that helps very much for f further solving the problems like why the child is demotivated or has behavior problems or refuses to work at school so that's so important for the assistant to help a particular child the most frequent problems that we have to deal with is attendance, especially in the second half of the school year, then behavior, bullying, and we can say that it's bullying by both Czech and Ukrainian children. We experience it on both sides. The language barrier, even though we work intensively on the check of the Ukrainian children. Unfortunately, still, it's frequently not the case. And then we have to deal with parents' problems. Unfortunately, not all Ukrainian parents understand how the educational system works in the Czech Republic. 
and mainly it's hard to persuade them that the children really do need a pedagogical or psychological tests or assessment. They are afraid of the diagnosis. I spoke or have spoken with teachers that I consider the most experienced teachers on in the elementary schools and I got different uh, hints or uh, what to do or what not to do like the same content of teaching it's good if the children from the Ukraine have the same content as the Czech children and the language and the extra teaching for language has, is on the top of the standard education. It's very good also if the Ukrainian children have a special uh, tutors or teachers or assistants and it will be nice if, the, if there is a unified system where everybody would put down what they did so that the uh, class teacher knows what the children should know or already know. Then summer conversational course, that's something that is needed. And then another thing from the teachers is to create the elementary textbook for the Ukrainian children. Uh, that's something, it's the first step with a lot of pictures so that the children understand. And I also agree that this would be very helpful. My colleague already showed me that I should finish. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I know the most important thing is that we know about each other. We can network uh, during the break and after the break. So now, Natalia Tesarek who's been working for us as an assistant basically now for 10 years. So come forward. I'm nervous, so sorry for that. And hope you understand. I would like to introduce the school in Rakvice. So I'm Natalia Tesarek and I've been living here for 10 years. I'm also from the Ukraine. I have two children and in September I joined the elementary school in Rakvice as an assistant for the Ukrainian ch children and I'm in charge of 32 children from class grade 1 to grade 9. So I have to say the first two weeks were terrible. We did not know how to organize things so together with teachers we agreed that we would organize this timetable when each class would have their lesson when I can help in class one we always went for the first and ninth grades where we basically communicate in Czech share our experiences we speak about what they like what they dislike so that they feel sort of relaxed and comfortable I have to say that my great advantage is that our principal uh, gave me a mobile phone where Ukrainian parents can call me between 8 and 2 and ask me any question, what they don't understand or what they need to be explained so that they don't have to come to school. We can talk about things on the phone and agree on what to do. I have my office where we have our classes together with children. We use we use these materials which are the most important for us because obviously we use uh, materials that will uh, train children to learn how to speak that understand instructions can respond. Uh, pictures of what they can see and hear that helps the most. 
different pictures that the children go through so that they can learn. We work in, school, in groups, in pairs. We always agree so that children can f feel comfortable. You cannot force children uh, to work if they don't want to. So it has to be a combination of work and fun. And I have to say that uh, there has been great development. We create, we paint, we learn the Czech habits. So we we have the like the tradition of burning witches on the end of or at the end of April, then birthday wishes and so on. And it was interesting that even Czech children uh, joined us and there were more cards from the Czech children. It was very encouraging and pleasant. And at the end, I want to share that we do not only work, and I'm proud that five children of the ninth grade participated in a ball for the Ukrainian children, a ball is not like a ball in the Czech Republic. We had to learn uh, how to behave and great job has been done by parents, teachers and pupils. They communicated with each other. Even I had to learn how to dance vals because one of the pupils was a boy and it worked perfectly. And I think that everybody was happy, including parents. This is unfortunately not everybody. There were many ill, but this is, these are my pupils. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank you three times. First, for sticking to the time limit. Number two, for showing us at least a little bit uh, of children. It was it was a criticism that we hardly get in touch with children and it's great to see their shining eyes. And number three, thank you very much for presenting a bridge to our last topic, which is the informal education or borderless education. We can see great potential in that as well. We have seen not only integration, we have seen inculturation of the Ukrainian pupils and mothers and gr it's great to have balls in the local communities such as Valtice. So we will go in the dancing rhythm of Vals to the break and we will have intercontinental interview with a wonderful lady. Uh, Hans is no longer here with us, but he was my discovery of 2022. He pointed out a young lady who was in Cambridge. Now she's going to join Harvard and at three o'clock she's going to connect. So please have a coffee or whatever you find there. Because then we'll go to the Spielberg Castle with a lot of refreshment and be here back for three o'clock. Krásné odpoledne. Děkujeme, že se scházíme zpátky z workshopu zase do So we are going back from workshops. And the last session is ready for us and it's borderless education and it will be without borders in several meanings of the word. But before we start, we want to remind you of what we already announced. At the end of the block, or this session, there is going to be a bus in front of the building who will take us to the Spielberg Castle. So it will help us to climb up the hill. We don't have to walk without suffering. So if you don't match inside, don't cannot fit inside the bus, um, it'll work as a shuttle. So don't panic if you are, if you don't find your seat in the first round. So, but. Uh, we want to enjoy the views from the top of the hill and from the castle, so let's go for it. So I said that the borderless education will be on several different levels. So we will overcome the border of the place and time. By this I mean that uh, we get somewhere where we cannot be physically. The first personality, Sofia Karatsed and Richard Uhl and Michal Uhl and then Iris Zaitz. And the purpose of this 
event, as we said at the beginning, is not only to look back to the last school year, but also to feel the good smell of holidays where we cross the borders, get inspiration for studying abroad and so on. I think that Sofia is online now, so I can greet her in her own language. Yeah. In the United States. Oh, so you're at home. <laughs> So we met Sofia, it was thanks to Hans Brookman. Hans was here this morning, uh, who sort of indicated me, pointed me out to, to Sofia last, Janu last January. Uh, and Sofia became for me a personality of the year, 2023, I must say, I must admit. She in that time studied in Cambridge. She finished already her doctorate, her PhD doctorate. Uh, and now she moved to the States. And I think since next week, or no, yeah, from next week, Sophia will start to work at Harvard University to, to continue her postdoctoral research. Uh, Sophia will explore in his uh, story, let's say, uh, the rich human formation that person receives beyond the geographical borders of their homes, even if she is at home now, and the personal border of formal setting of education. Based on experience across secondary school and university, she will share principles or rules for the fruitful use of free time in these ways. In particular, I, she will focus on the need to take risk of openness and the need to be critically loyal to tradition. So, Sophia, before I give you the floor, I must also express my gratitude that, that my daughter came to, to hear you, my oldest daughter, Anna. So we have one more child here, <laughs> not only adults, but also child, children. And now we are listening to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the very kind invitation and for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen because I have a couple photos that will hopefully help everyone follow my presentation. Does that look all right? Yes. Okay, great. It's a great gift to be able to join you today at the end of your academic year as you're reflecting on the path that you've traveled this year and the road ahead of you and in particular to join in conversation about this um, important essential topic of, of educating without borders. As David mentioned, I am a Marshall Scholar at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom, uh, where I just finished a PhD in neuroscience and I'm now moving to Boston to take up a research position at Harvard. And throughout my academic formation, the whole of it, but especially since secondary school, I've received an education without borders, an education that was not kept contained within the geographical area of my home here in the United States, nor kept contained within the walls of a school. So in other words, I received teaching and formation far beyond the boundaries of a formal education in the United States. And it's my great conviction that this kind of education and education without borders is unparalleled in its ability to bring young students to maturity. In my case, most often, this occurred through spending summer holidays or entire academic years away from my home in a wide variety of settings. And these experiences have culminated in my position as an academic ambassador to the United Kingdom over the last four years through the British Marshall Scholarship. So today I want to share a few of these experiences with you. Um, in particular, I have four of them in mind. Um, experiences that are each tied to principles that I learned about education, principles that I believe can help us see and seize the fruits of educating without borders. So I'm going to go chronologically through these four experiences. So in other words, I'm gonna start with the one I had earliest in my life, in my education, and continue until the present day. 
So the first experience I want to share with you of an education without borders occurred during high school or secondary school. When I was 15 years old, my parents offered to send me for a year abroad of study in Milan in Italy. I could attend an Italian school as my parents had taught me Italian as a child and live with an Italian family and immerse myself in Italian culture. And I eagerly accepted my parents' offer because I was very attracted to the idea of spending a year abroad, to the image that I had of what living in Italy would be like. In my adolescent vanity, I pictured myself coming home from this year abroad with the latest foreign fashions and cultural experiences and new exotic friends. Soon after my arrival, however, reality disabused me of these ideas because life in Italy was remarkably similar to life at home in the United States. My high school imposed the same difficult daily tasks. My classmates had the same anxieties and concerns. My heart was full of the same questions. So my ideological preconception or my image of studying abroad was shattered, which was painful for me at the time. But the death of this image of what it would be like to study abroad allowed me to become open to the reality around me, reality as it actually was. So the death of my preconceptions allowed me to encounter my studies and to encounter the people around me and to encounter this new place that I lived in for the first time. And in this way, my year abroad became a season of many surprises. I would say this probably began first in my studies. In Italy, unlike in the United States, secondary school students study philosophy and art history and medieval literature and many other subjects that American students most of the time will never touch during their, sec their time in secondary school. And I fell in love with these topics. And not only these topics in isolation, but how my professors clearly showed that each subject fit together into a coherent picture of the history of culture and of reason and of the human heart. All of these subjects were one. And so all of a sudden, I discovered that my classes were no longer disconnected and dry, as I had experienced in the United States, but united and exciting. And so I was no longer motivated only by my desire for academic perfection, which had been my main driver in the United States. I would say that I regained through this discovery some of the natural curiosity that I'd had as a child about the world. So this was the first surprising encounter. The second place that I was surprised was in friendship with my classmates because they spent time together in ways that were new to me. They, they did things together that American teenagers would never do. So for example, sometimes in the evenings they would get together and sing songs or on a weekend, they would take a trip to the mountains just to study and to hike together. Or they would get coffee with their professors to ask them questions about life or spend time with the families of their friends. So my Italian classmates didn't seem to see their time as a way to build a resume or a CV that would be very attractive to universities. And this is the way that my American classmates back home looked at their time as a means to this end of getting into college. Instead, my Italian classmates sought elements of a life that would make them genuinely joyful. And by sharing in this life with them and following in their example, I discovered a way of being in, in my studies, but also outside of my studies, that was more fulfilling to how I had been living back home. So at the end of this, this year, when I was 16, because of the encounters that I'd had in my studies and with my friends, I came home different changed because I wanted these surprises to continue happening. I didn't want to go back home to just chase after perfect grades or a perfect college application. So I entered my school environment and my family environment and the environment of my friendships a new person, someone who desired to see the unity of life and to know its meaning, and so encouraged my friends and other students around me to do the same. So this transformation became a gift for my whole school. But for me to have received this particular education without borders, I had first needed to let go of my preconceptions, to move beyond my ideas, and to be open to surprising encounters with another. 
So that's the first principle of education that I learned during through this experience, to be open to surprising encounters. The second principle I learned a few years later, I had just completed my first year of university and I had loved it, but I'd also been troubled by the possible um, narrowness or insularity of our campus. There were free, few students at my university who had radically different backgrounds from myself. There were few, for example, who had faced uh, serious poverty or hardship. So in part for this reason, this narrowness, I decided to spend the summer in Paraguay working at a community foundation for the poor of Asuncion, which is the capital city. And this foundation was called the Fundación San Rafael. I spent my mornings during this summer in a school for underprivileged children. And I was in particular tutoring students with special needs. And in the afternoon, I would walk around the corner, staying in the foundation, but just around the corner to an orphanage where I helped care for 20 young children without parents, many of whom had come from the slums. And in this complex of buildings that you see in front of you, there's also a palliative care clinic for the dying, a hospital for those with serious mental and physical handicaps, a food bank and more. It was the closest at that time in my life that I had ever lived to acute human suffering, or at least to acute human suffering that wasn't hidden, that wasn't hidden by our Western capital, capitalist self-sufficiency and the appearance of um, self-sufficiency that we give one another in the United States. And my openness to surprising encounters with others that I had learned in Milan led me to suffer with them in a different way, of course. It was a different suffering. It was a suffering of empathy. It was the suffering of my own powerlessness and my own incapacity to change these circumstances. And the suffering of the question of whether the pain that I saw was meaningless or whether it had an answer. And yet in all of this suffering, the suffering of the people in front of me and my own suffering, I could not deny what my eyes saw, that there were presences around me, people around me who lived with hope. And in particular, I think of Father Aldo, who was the priest who began this foundation, this, this um, ministry to the poor, and the religious sisters who worked with him, as well as the volunteers, and even some of the patients and the children themselves who were recipients of their ministry. All of these people were human, just like me. They were helpless, and sometimes they were in a bad mood, just like me. And yet, I saw that these people around me lived with a certainty of the goodness of life and certain of the fact that they belonged to one another. And these convictions enabled them to begin again each day, as if for the first time, to seek the good of those who were suffering in their city. And all I could do that summer was to look at these witnesses. They became authorities for me. They became people to follow. So I tried to put my feet in their footsteps through these weeks. And through following them, what otherwise I think would have been an experience of alienation, of difficulty that took me away from myself, of a pain that was too heavy to carry. Instead, that experience became an experience of life. My eyes were opened to a truer freedom and a truer human flourishing that's possible even in these circumstances. As I came home from Paraguay to the United States at the end of the summer, I realized that I needed guidance again because I knew that the same human suffering that I had seen at this foundation was also present back home in the United States in the schools and hospitals and streets of my own community. So far from disregarding these needs because of what I'd seen in Paraguay, I'd been sensitized. I felt a new need to share life with people in my local community who lived in difficulty. And yet I knew that if this was going to be true and good work, I needed to continue following authorities. I needed to continue following people who embodied a passion for justice and mutual belonging. So I found people, professors and older students at my university who guided me as I sought to put into practice what I had learned in Paraguay. And these authorities guided me through my final years of university. So this is the second principle, to reap the benefits of an education without borders, particularly when it involves these risks. We need to follow those around us who have authority Students need to follow authoritative presences if they're going to grow from their experience. 
What I learned through the guidance of my own authorities led me to the conviction that I wanted to go to graduate school to study neuroscience and in particular to research the effects of childhood trauma on the brain. So I applied for a Marshall Scholarship to study in the United Kingdom and was very privileged to receive this. As I prepared to move across the world for this incredible opportunity, I knew that I needed to begin with a heart open to surprises as I had learned in Milan, which meant that I needed to have an interior silence, a silence of the heart. I needed to be aware of my purpose in going to the United Kingdom and of my identity. And I worried that this would be difficult to maintain in Cambridge. So with the help of the authorities around me, of course, I decided to spend the summer after I finished my undergraduate college degree at a monastery. And in particular, this was the Abbey of St. Walburga, which is a community of 30 Roman Catholic nuns who live an ordered daily life of prayer and work. So every day they alternate times of chanting the Psalms and praying together in the chapel with running a cattle farm, as you see on the right. It is a radical life. They never leave the property unless necessary. They're completely obedient to one another and they spend most of their days in silence. It's a life that from the outside can look very narrow and even unfree. But during this summer, I was surprised by another discovery that this daily rhythm of prayer and work made the nuns more free, not less, and made them capable of embracing everyone and everything. And so trying to follow their example, I began to offer my smallest actions for the world, like cleaning the chicken coop or sweeping the chapel floor or washing dishes. I tried to keep in mind the meaning of life and the needs of other people as I was doing these actions. And suddenly I discovered that I too was free and I too was happy. So this is the third principle that I discovered, that to seek the universal, we must go into the particular and go through the particular. And I think this is true of all of education. Education leads us beyond the bounds of our particular circumstances. It leads us beyond our time and place into universal questions and universal answers, but not by running away from our circumstances and where we are placed. Instead, by digging deeply into the place where we are planted, this is how we reach the universal. And this movement, this principle became the foundation of my graduate studies because as those of you who have done PhDs will know, graduate school is in a time of intense narrowness, focusing on a single question that maybe you alone out of the whole world has considered in that much detail or to that extent. For me, this narrow question was how early abuse and neglect change the organization of brain networks. It's a very narrow question, but with the example of the nuns in mind, I kept asking to discover through giving myself to this narrow question, the whole of the universe. And my request was granted. I discovered beauty and order within the brain. I discovered the freedom of a human person. I discovered interdependence and my own joy. But to make these universal discoveries, I needed to be faithful and obedient to the particular subject and the particular tasks that my education asked of me, seeking the universal through the particular. As you will remember from the start, this took place in the United Kingdom on the support of a British Marshall Scholarship. This is a program that aims to form ambassadors to the United Kingdom that will cultivate its special relationship with the United States. So from the start during my time in graduate school, I was very aware of where I came from. I was very aware of the traditions that I embodied and aware of how these might be different from or challenged by what I encountered in Cambridge and in the United Kingdom. So in particular, as I'm reflecting on this embodiment of tradition, three traditions come to mind. The first is the tradition of my country, of the United States. The second is my tradition of the discipline of neuroscience, of the topic of research that I pursued. And the third is the tradition of my religion, of the Roman Catholic Church. And all three of these traditions were put to test by the reality around me. In the first place, with respect to my country, I discovered different ways of being culturally that showed me some of the limitations of the American people and the American government. In simple things, like I think that Americans are often more 
ignorant of the Western intellectual tradition, but also in more serious things like a lack of respect for the self-sovereignty of foreign nations. So this was a challenge to my belonging to the tradition of the United States. And secondly, with respect to my belonging to the tradition of neuroscience, I discovered that the philosophy of neuroscience and some of its profound critiques of the methods and claims of neuroscientific research, and this profoundly challenged me in my work. And third, with respect to my religion, I was challenged by discovering fragmentations, a, a division within Christianity, as I was living as a Catholic in a predominantly Protestant and largely secular country. In all three of these places, my country, my science, and my religion, I could have abandoned my own tradition, either to adopt what was in front of me blindly, or to become a relativist and to conclude that neither tradition is better than the other. And I think this would have made the experience of an education without borders a threat to the education I had received before. It would have undermined all that had been given to me in my culture, in my studies, in my religion. But instead of abandoning my own tradition, with the help of the authorities around me, I realized that I could be critically loyal to my own traditions. What do I mean by critical loyalty? Well, first of all, it is loyalty. So to be faithful to the formation that I had received in each of these places, but it's not blind loyalty, it's critical loyalty. So I didn't have to turn a blind eye to the limits of my traditions or the places that it might be in need of correction or amplification. So in other words, critical loyalty is being faithful to the education one has received, to the tradition one belongs to, but faithful like a daughter rather than faithful like a puppet. So being a daughter of my nation meant recognizing ways in which Americans can learn from the UK and be even truer to our founding principles. Being a daughter of neuroscience meant being honest about its limitations and working from within to improve its methods and to improve its claims about reality. And being a daughter of the Roman Catholic Church meant verifying the truth of my denomination, not taking it for granted, and once having done so, working for unity with other people. So through critical loyalty to my traditions, I was able to discover immeasurably more richness in British culture, in British science, and in British religion than I would have otherwise, because I had a firm rock on which to stand, a foundation from which I could explore without fear everything around me. I had a criterion that I could compare my discoveries to. And so every point of difference between me and the people around me became an occasion for growth, not a threat or something to hide from. Growth for me and growth for my tradition, for my traditions. And this is something that I hope will continue bearing fruit as I move back to Boston, to the United States. As I do so in these weeks, I'm keeping these lessons in mind, these experiences that I've had in mind of an education without borders, of openness to surprising encounters, of the need to follow authoritative presences, and of seeking the universal through the particular and in critical loyalty to tradition. Not just for myself, although I know I need all of these things, but also because I'm going to begin teaching students in this year to come. And as all of you know very well, the role of the educator is perhaps the most important of all of society because your task is to accompany young people to maturity not by substituting your freedom for theirs and not by even worse, substituting your knowledge for their freedom, but by walking alongside them as they too discover through surprising encounters, the truth of reality. So I thank you for this work and I thank you for welcoming me today. And I wish you all the best for cultivating education without borders in your own communities. Sophia, thank you so much. Uh, it was sort of symphony of four sentences, four parts. <laughs> As I know, you love music. Uh, thank you for this example, Sophia. For me, is kind of we always we are looking for examples of good practice of schools and teachers. Sophia, for me, is an example of good practice concerning 
let's say, results of our education. When our education goes on well, personalities like Sofia can be then the fruits of it. So thank you again. Uh, we are now going to sort of frame your experience with the example, with the case of director of Center for International Studies in the Czech Republic. It's my colleague Marketa who is going to present him. Thank you very much. And I will not be able to talk to you, so I would like to mention that if you would like to talk to you, Sofia. Before I continue, um, I would like to point out Sofia's podcast called The Pilgrim Soul. It's really worth listening to. So if you'd like to um, enrich your horizons, you can listen to her podcast. We've agreed in putting um, Sophia in this panel by saying that informal education and traveling can um, enrich and deepen a person's horizon and outlook on life. And another optimist in traveling and other ways in changing society, not just individuals. Um, that's the director of the uh, House of International Cooperation. He's the representative or rather graduate of gender studies at Masaryk University and also another department at Charles University. And he will present the possibilities of um, the International Studies House in Brno. And that's the easiest thing you can do today. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, enabling me to be here with you today. It's a very pleasant um, thing to do. After such a compliment, I have to say that I've been always fascinated by people from Western Europe, especially from the Anglo-Saxon um, region, have very good presentations, how they can build up their story and their, their speech. And in the morning, where I spent time by listening to the Czech presentations, I've learned a lot of interesting things. The presentations were entertaining and funny. And it fills me with optimism somewhat that the long journey since 1989 that we've had has been perhaps in the right direction and some things have changed and the quality of presentations has improved even in the Czech environment bef than what it was before. Before I come to my presentation, uh, I'd like to share one more thought. I'm going to be speaking a lot about the contributions of international education. I think international education is truly extraordinary and I'd like to say why I think it is so. It seems that international education brings quality. In the morning we had Tomar Zatlukal saying that the schools that are involved in his uh, international education show higher levels of quality because it's something that the schools can draw from and and that moves them ahead and when we remember or recall our lives be around us before 25 years ago 30 years ago then it was completely different than today today's world is extremely interconnected in the 1990s we have perhaps gotten our first emails the sound of the computer was the PC speaker of a uh, dial-up uh, internet, which was incredibly slow and the world was generally very, or it wasn't as connected as today. Global world requires also the change uh, in approaching, in earning money because our pupils will only live in a global interconnected world and we had a contribution of Dr. Sofia Carozza, who's gone through various continents. She visited Europe and elsewhere, and her professional and study access is extremely international. And from her presentation, we can tell that her contribution by having spent some time abroad has given her a different perspective on many aspects and without having experienced some time outside of our comfort zone of what we call home, we can't understand some things and the global interconnection 
cannot be or the global competences that we require or that we should require from Czech population or European population and our pupils can only be acquired through an international experience. The House of International Cooperation uh, presents numerous activities and programs enabling to cross the borders, uh, whether the borders are among people or among in thoughts, the most efficient and our most iconic program is the Erasmus Plus program. I'm going to speak about three parts of this program. A specialized education for secondary schools, with the exception of grammar schools, then Erasmus for general education and Erasmus for informal education. The House of International Cooperation has voluntary projects, solidarity, bilateral cooperation and further activities such as student communities abroad and so on. We can leave it for some other time. The name of this conference is the, the Education Village. The country as the Education Village and the region as the Education Village was the last year's topic. So the criticism that we should be on the level of the national state is also wrong because the space that we have that we share in Europe is the European space and we need to talk about the shared European educational space and the opportunities that the European unit, Union gives us through Erasmus are extraordinary. As the House of International Cooperation helps us to cross the physical limits, I asked the question, what are the limits? The border or limit is a theoretical line with real impact. There is not just borders between countries, but each institution's got a limit towards the founding organization or the students that have a certain social environment and don't have the same opportunities to do, get or to draw from the educational system what they need. There are many limits and borders that we have and schools uh, have to fight many of the problems and it was mentioned within the pilot 14 when we are trying to find out what the problems are and through the physical mobility and physical crossing the borders we are helping to solve the other borders. This is a popular map It's a map or index of educational problems. You probably all know them. But I'm glad that this is something that is relatively known today. And we speak about these things. And there's a consensus that the problems that we have in the educational system, that they do exist. And this map correlates with the holders of Erasmus Plus grants that we have across the country. The system is such that an institution uh, sub submits a grant and the best projects succeed. I don't want to say that this is the result of this. It's not. But I would rather expect the opposite causality, the colorfulness of the map is sort of similar to the previous map, but we can expect that successful institutions are also successful in applications for grants because they are able to write correct applications. They have good methodological uh, leaders, active teachers, and, and an understanding director. And at the same time, we know that the benefit and the support then the, the student who gets his C's and D's, if they go to Italy to learn how to, uh, I don't know, make pasta or Italian food, the benefit for those pupils who have uh, poor results is much better than in case of best pupils. 
and it's true also on the level of institutions. The schools that have the problems draw from the international experience much more. Unfortunately, what frequently happens is that the initial reaction of the school manager or principal is, is, well, yeah, Erasmus, it's nice, but we have different problems than Erasmus. That's nice, but I don't have time for this. And they have priority. But this is one of the great misunderstandings that international cooperation is not the goal or tool. This tool is frequently a shortcut to achieve something that we see as important, something that can help the school. I have four areas here that are based on recommendations of the Czech School Inspectorate from the methodology, from the research. So these are areas that are important for quality schools. First area, quality of the teaching team retention of high quality teachers, recruitment of young teachers and professional development. These things can be developed by means of Erasmus because course, courses in abroad and shadowing in a foreign school, that's something that motivates the teachers and moves them forward and solves or helps to deal with things. It's a tool that respect, um, reflect the recommendations. I'm originally a sociologist, so I'm, I like diagrams and researches of sociology and so I like working with these data. And this is one of the outcomes from a research that we organized when we asked the coordinating teachers, I guess that these were, that was specialized education, and we asked them, 10 minutes, uh, I'm in, in the middle of that, that works. So we asked what they gained, they say new knowledge, uh, new context for cooperation, inspiration for using new teaching methods. So stepping out of the everyday routine and cooperation with another teacher or a learning period somewhere abroad shows that it's a great motivator and helps the burnout of teachers and solves the problems that were mentioned in the previous diagram. New information received in the program incorporated in the teaching. I can recommend, I got a lot of new ideas and topics for my work. The studying period motivated me to further improve my English. Frequently we speak about the language training, it's the, it's the main goal of international cooperation. It's not the case, it's only one of the outcomes. But there are other aspects, like personal aspects, are much more important from my point of view. Key competencies. First, I spoke about the global competencies, but the research shows that the key competencies can be developed even through Erasmus and are developed. Because sometimes it's really difficult to include competencies for learning or teaching and competencies to problem solving and communication, how to incorporate them in the curriculum. What Once you go abroad for a short term study period or long term individual uh, practical training abroad, the international aspect, the crossing the borders, not only the physical ones, but also personal borders, stepping out of the comfort zone, encourages the uh, strengthening of key competencies. Another research, to uh, deal with people from different cultures, communicate with people speaking different languages, cooperate in a team, finding solutions in difficult situations, achieve something within the community, learn in a fun way or entertaining way. All these things are from the researches uh, done on students that participated in Erasmus+. Plus. The benefits that, uh, that we recorded f from students as well as teachers, there are many of them. There are studies not only in the Czech Republic but also from our colleagues in other 
uh, other agencies in different countries. I know that people shouldn't be judged by nationalities. I loved it there. I can only recommend learn so that you can go abroad as well. I learned that I can be independent and communicative in spite of the language barrier. The personality growth, uh, like a scout team, where children learn themselves naturally, they also get it by leaving their homeland and see how people live outside, see different environments, different challenges, uh, different setups in those countries, different cultures or cultural barriers or dimensions of the different cultures is something that enriches them. Out of school support of pupils, we frequently speak about informal education. I myself through an alternative educational system and when I returned to the Czech one, I was surprised that we finished at 12 or 1 o'clock. I was used to schools finishing at late in the afternoon and the pressure of our educational system is to have certain activities in the afternoon. Th that's enormous. Like Western Europe's uh, children spend hours at school and they don't deal with the informal education because the, uh, uh, the formal education is much more. While, while here the informal education is really supported and pressed here because the diversity is something that the Czech population can uh, benefit from. Professional development of people working with the youth. We have one of the envelopes within Erasmus, which is focusing on people who work with the youth so that they can learn abroad and see how it works in other countries, how things can be done differently or better systematic cooperation on the local level. That's something that is extraordinarily important. Always being supported by the uh, local government, supported by other actors, regional cooperation. We always try to speak with regional entities, leisure offices and institutions so that they can understand better what the benefits are so that they do not hinder their schools or slow them down. And on the contrary, they support them. Let me go to another slide, which shows the accredited consortiums. And I'll show you a very positive example of a consortium. What is a consortium? That several institutions join together and their mother institution applies for registration of a consortium. And at the same time, we have something new and it's accreditation. And you say, we are great. Uh, we put down and each uh, you get accreditation and you don't have to contest for the support every year. So you apply only for the public support. A great example, the city of Brno. It applied for accreditation and all its kindergartens and elementary schools, 176, got accreditation. They have a consortium and they have great plan how to implement international cooperation. So city is the owner of the public transport, so the buses will be almost for free. And frequently we organize friendship with Bratislava in Slovakia. So even this Czech-Slovak cooperation is very beneficial for both the children and the school the teachers of kindergartens, including the handicapped localities. And this is a nice example how even the city can be a founder that can reflect its attitude and approach to these schools and influence the form of the elementary schools and kindergartens. And everybody's happy, including those uh, there is a university, Erasmus, who get it after, 10 years after, knowing uh, their professional path. They all say that it had a crucial and positive impact on their professional career. Teachers, this was a qualitative research. The teachers are also very happy. And this is one of the things they say, well, this moved me forward. This is something that I enjoyed doing. This was crucial for my development. I can't imagine my f further way without it. And a positive 
message at the end. Erasmus Plus is growing continually. This is the previous program period. This is the current one. The vector is increasing. We have seven year periods in the EU budget wise. And in this uh, financial framework, which will conclude in 2027, there will be always more financial resources every year. The goal, which we have to be aware of, if we see it as something that is un indispensable, so I need to, or I learn to read and write and to calculate in school, but I need some international experience on top of that because otherwise I won't understand the world. And the truth is that it will not be possible in the future to have a quality full life without understanding a broader context of the world around me because the globalization and connection is huge and it's a condition also for people to understand the political project of the EU and its contribution because only by experiencing international um, an international stay, well, they will understand while we live in this type of community. Nowadays, we can send 15% of the population abroad. Half of them are uh, university students and the other half are people working in education. And we can probably that way affect an international segment of the population. And it will be a question of negotiation, how much how many financial resources are we going to get for the following period, 2027 and later? Because the ultimate goal that we would like to reach is that everyone in Europe will have been affected by some international exchange, either by going abroad or by participating in some international project at home in an international environment, they will have an international classmate from another country or by having a group of foreign students visit, etc. Because you have to understand that way that we are not alone in the world and that the diversity is something that is natural and that's something that's enriching and needed. In conclusion, I would like to present two deadlines, two dates for informal education of youth and a, a small partnership and last but not least accreditation for repeated long-term um, trips. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for your attention. Thank you Michal. None of us would have ever been here if we had never met two different aspects. No one can grow without having encountered something that's different. By knowing, getting to know what's different, it causes us to grow. That's a fact. Yishi Zaitz, silver wolf, bearer of the highest scouts award. I would like Yiji to speak about the results of the conference thanks to his wisdom. If I went here at a conference, but rather in our forest summer school, well, that I would say, let's go and run outside for at least 15 minutes because I imagine most of you are already completely shattered. Uh, I apologize that I don't have any presentation because I was basically bound to listening to what people before me have said and I will be very brief. Hopefully there'll be some space for things that might interest you or that you'd like to um, ask. From what we heard from Sophia, I heard that she would be speaking about walking or pilgrimage, but she did speak about interesting things nonetheless. Um, all four points were interesting. From the point of view of the area where, um, where I've been active in, which is called informal education nowadays, it's called 
Hopefully someone will understand in the future or everyone will understand what it means. The first point that she mentioned was that it's very important for people to know the meaning of what they do. Her move from the United States to Italy, it surprised me that Americans are so degenerate somewhere that they see the education only as a means to have put it in their CV and then they got to a prestigious school. I did see a research that has show, that shown that significant positions in the United States are given to people from very, very few prestigious universities, which is, of course, very sad. Hopefully, it's not the case in this country. The question of the meaning is very important. That if girls and boys that we have in our scouts troops wouldn't be excited about the meaning of what we do, they would run away. Um, they wouldn't be there. They are all there voluntarily. No one has sent them. No one is going to test them. Uh, and and they, they were not promised uh, a good grade at the end. I'll, I'll come back to it in connection to Michal's uh, presentation. Secondly, a very important the, quest, the, uh, the experience from Paraguay. It was an experience of touching suffering. And it seems to me that Western society is really avoiding suffering so terribly that when they do encounter it, they're completely lost. Sometimes I go through s secondary school students' blogs and sometimes I read the debates underneath. And I found a debate of first grade of secondary school and they were discussing the fact that their classmate has died. But the debate was very monotonous. Life is useless was basically the point they were making. They weren't prepared at all to encounter pain or something that transcends the general busyness of what surrounds people. So the meaning and the meaning of what is difficult, what is hard, because life is hard. I think us scouts know that very well since twice in the night your roof falls on your head because you've built it badly and everything is wet. Well, you see the pressure of life there. But when I was a child, no one was interested in how I felt. No one at all. And today it's the other extreme. Everyone sort of on tenterhooks to, to make sure that children are not worried or that they are not afraid. 20 years ago when I led the boys in the scout group, half of the parents would probably tell me, what do you dare? It's Would you dare to do this? It's dangerous or they're going to be sweaty. It's something that seems pretty dangerous to me for the Western society. It's gone really weak um, and an encounter with suffering uh, is sad, but in order to be able to bear an encounter with suffering, you have to encounter a trustworthy authority that shows you how to live with suffering. When we did great research at NPI of various values among children, and we asked them what are their examples, half of the children said that they had none which I think it's tragic because for me, Vinetu and Old Chatterhand and Masaryk were absolutely key figures. Thirdly, a meeting in a monastery or convent. I've been waiting for it to develop somewhere and there was the understanding of the fact that universal values have to be lived in the specific areas and that is doing well in the areas of informal education much better than informal education. But in connecting formal and informal education, you can see that what functions in the informal education in our troops, it does or it is possible to transfer into the formal education. And the fourth point, tradition. It seems to me that Czech 
society has completely lost the understanding for tradition. It's not grandma's chest of smelly things, but it's about understanding where we are in history. For us scouts, tradition is very important, of course. We see, and not just the tradition of the 20th century, but we even see St. Wenceslas, St. Agnes and Comenius, just as Masaryk or Havel. Tradition is extremely important contribution for us to understand our journey. And now something about what Michal Ull has mentioned. Two things. He focused on competencies. In my opinion, unless the way of relationships and gaining relationships in competencies in schools as they are in informal education, they will never be acquired in school because competencies require much more time than just knowledge. We know that. And the verification, that's another trick. All of that takes a lot of time. And good competencies always have to have an attitude. We don't learn an attitude by writing that into the notebook. And the last thing, the outlook abroad, it's been shown very nicely, enables one to see the world in a very broader whole. And that's a chance for us if we are, if we do care about children and youth, it's to show them that their life is a great story that can transcend much more than what they just see by encountering what they see during Erasmus. I saw that on my own children. And it opens you an understanding that we are a part of a huge, great story. Human life is not just a blubbering of a fool, as King Lear says, but it's a great story and it's much greater than we can imagine. So that's, that's it, my time is up. Perhaps just 30 seconds for a question. Jiří, děkujeme. <laughs> Thank you, Jiří, very much. Uh, I heard people saying, well, no, 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 don't stop yet. We want to hear more. Okay, next time. Thank you very much. It's three, three o'clock, 59 minutes. So thank you for summarizing or closing today's program. I think that it was a nice, uh, portfolio of interesting contributions. So thank you very much for your closing comments. Very important. So by this, we are finishing the first part of our meeting. Now we'll have one hour long break during which we should get uh, to the Spierbeck Castle and let's move to a completely different atmosphere. Exterior, wine, sun, music, and you will be able to see how warm it is outside. Then the minister, his deputy, and another deputy, and uh, Ivo Yupa the third time. So now you will be able to, to speak the 12th time about the things that you wanted to share. So please do join us and see you at the castle. Amen. A jenom ještě jednou zopakuju, kdo jste někdy pořádali takovou akci, tak tušíte, co je zatím za práci. Takže děkuju, teď se aspoň dívám pohledy, nebudu jmenovat, protože to člověk vždycky na někoho zapomene, ale koho vidím, tomu děkuji a koho nevidím, tomu taky moc děkuju. Drahým kolegyním téměř ve skrze jsou to dámy, jak z Prahy, tak z Brna, za tu obřímý práci s tím, co tak rychle vlastně uteklo. Díky moc.